seeing a presence of a quorum, I'll call this uh, meeting of the Amherst Pullman Regional School Committee to order. Uh, we are currently being taped uh, for future broadcast by Amherst Media, uh, and uh, we're going to our first order of business is going to go to executive session. If we do so successfully, then we'll be gone for a little bit, and then back a little bit after that, because we will enter back into meeting after the conclusion of the executive session. Uh, so. Um, I move in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, Hustein versus Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Uh, uh, and I do so because, as chair, I find that an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the litigation position of the committee. Uh, and we do have plans to return to open session at the conclusion of the executive session. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded by Ms. McDonald. Uh, this requires a roll call vote. so. I will start on this end of the table. Cassinson, aye. Ordonez, aye. <clears throat> McDonald, aye. Nakajima, aye. Spitzer, aye. Demling, aye. Menino, aye. <coughs> We're voting to go into executive session. Oh, still have an aye. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, is, it is unanimous. Um, we are in executive session. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to call to order uh, again, or recall to order in open session, uh, this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. It is now around seven minutes of seven, something like that. Uh, and the first order of business, approval of minutes of April 9th, 2019. I know people have a chance to take a look at them, hopefully. If they have any corrections that they would make to these minutes. Mr. Dunlap. Uh Just one on, it's item G, um, that's towards the end there. Um, 6G advocacy. 6G advocacy. Uh, the sentence, Mr. Delming suggests that the committee advocate against the governor's proposed change to the baseline formula for funding charter schools. Um, if I recall, I was talking about charter reimbursements. You were. So that schools to reimbursements. Okay. We have that? Awesome. Are there other? I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Ardonius, seconded by McDonald. Um, any further edits, changes, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. And motion carries unanimously, which is now eight to nothing. And the next item of business is announcements and public comment. Are there announcements from the committee? Seeing none, we'll go to public comment. Uh, there isn't presently for the purposes of those watching later. There isn't anyone in the audience, uh, anyone else in the audience. Uh, so seeing no public comments, we'll close. Why do I just get uh, so we'll close public comments, uh, and we'll move on to subcommittee updates. Are there any subcommittee updates? I know we're doing a policy, uh, a couple policy items later. I guess we're uh, Just very brief on CPAC. Uh, we're meeting this Friday, uh, 9 to 1030 at Summit Academy. Um, I mentioned this before last time, but uh, for anyone watching this on tape, uh, if you uh, have interest in supporting the school's special ed services, uh, we're looking for new board members, and that could be a very micro-volunteer opportunity. So if your kid has been done right by special ed services in our schools and come see, or, or not, if you just want to support special ed services, come come to CPAC and uh, and see what we're all about. I was going to say, if somebody wants to fight City Hall, come on in. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a great group and, you know, great organization. So, right. did we, did we, uh, did she get her chance to put it in the, your, your superintendent's weekly update? The part about recruiting. Welcoming new CPAC members or looking for so new I was waiting for members. language I think I was going to receive. Oh, from uh, the CPAC? I thought, yeah, was I going to get that to you? I feel like we're talking about this in public, but I <laughs> thought you were going to get that. I will <laughs> Well, I guess I was, I was pushing it because I thought it was a good idea to get it, to do that. Oh, I agree. I will touch base with you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other subcommittee updates? <laughs> Seeing none, uh, we will move forward. Uh, for the superintendent's update. Is there something? I did not, I apologize, I did not get a written one. That's okay. But I will do, it's relatively brief, a number of the things I would typically 
share tonight are actually in the bottom part of the agenda, so um, I'll be brief. So this afternoon, I've taped the next episode of Window into Arps. It featured Anastasia Morton, who is um, kind of student, who is student leadership uh, specialist, the family center, and a high school student who I've known since he was in kindergarten or first grade at Crocker Farm. So it was uh, really nice, but really the focus was around student leadership in high school, and particularly for those who may not. Um, be, who may need additional support and that leadership doesn't have to be, yeah, I've got all, you know, my grades and all these other things together and I do leadership on top of that. It's really about how all students have opportunities to participate in leadership and, um, and broadening that base. So they were great. It was, it'll be a really good episode um, and that'll be out probably within a week. So thank you to Amherst Media for that work. Jody was off filming another meeting, otherwise I would have seen her twice today. So um, principal search update, just we'll have, by the end of the week, we'll have uh, announced the um, person who has been selected to be the principal of the high school. I think by Thursday we'll have that out, but certainly if not Thursday, then definitely by Friday. I know lots of people are anxiously awaiting that um, result, that completion of that search. Uh, last Saturday, ooh, yeah. So just a quick question, um, if you could just remind the committee, there were two or three uh, interviews, right? And, and do you have a sense of how many people attended those interviews? Sure. The so there were, th yeah, I'm sorry. There was three finalist interviews. Okay. Um, and it was hard because if we did them one, which we've done before for these kind of roles, one night after another, just because three people can't, people can't stay that long to see all three people. Um, but the attendance was, was pretty strong. Um, it wasn't the same every night, but it ranged between 20 and 40, um, the different nights. Uh, 20 low, 40 is the high. Um, and we got, Ms. Cunningham and I have read every single piece of feedback. And that was, you know, there was also student feedback came from sessions that each candidate had um, rotated through the lunches uh, at the high school, got to meet students as well as the faculty, um, an opportunity for faculty to meet each candidate right after school. So we got plenty of feedback, which was great. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, we had Leverett Town Meeting on Saturday, which uh, we appreciate the support of the Leverett community that went um, very quickly. I think it was the quickest, smoothest uh, we've had in the last, last five years or so, um, and broad support for the solution for the assessment methodology as well as the total budget amount. So um, Ms. Kaczynski, thank her again in absence for her, her presence. She did not run and, and they had an election. They do it at the town meeting in Leverett. So they had an election, but they'll reorganize their elementary committee with the regional rep uh, designated. I spoke to the chair of their elementary committee and she said, you know, they'll get on it at their next meeting. So we'll have a full compliment soon before we lose other people, I suppose. Um, uh, next Monday, which is the 6th, just two events. One is that um, the morning I'll be at RIAC. It's the last RIAC meeting of the year, Racial Imbalance Advisory Committee, and our charge is to write a formal report to the commissioner. Um, that's like technically our charge through the um, formation of the group, um, just talking about how we feel. There's been a lot of action on the eastern part of the state about METCO, so that's uh, grabbing a lot of our attention right now and potential changes to the METCO program and how we how we feel about that. Um, so that'll be, I know, part of that, but we'll also talk about broader equity issues as well. That afternoon, uh, the 6th at Monday, um, at the middle school auditorium will be the CPAC STARS event. So the STARS event, this is third, fourth year? I'm looking at Mr. Demling. I think it's, yeah, third or fourth, I don't know. I think it's four. Okay. Um, and a CPAC, basically the way it works is that anyone in the community, um, students, faculty, families can uh, acknowledge someone and um, suggest someone who's made a huge difference in the life of either individual or collective group of students with special needs. Um, so last week, I know Dr. Brady traveled all around the schools with presenting the awards and surprising staff members in front of their students, which was great. Um, Mr. Deming is one of the MCs again, I believe, and he does a wonderful job. Um, but it really is a, a special event. We don't have enough events in general where we acknowledge the great work of not just staff, I mean primarily staff, but also fellow students as well as community members. So everyone's welcome. So four o'clock, middle school um, library upstairs, and we hope to see some, <laughs> some of you there. And I think that's, given the other items on the agenda, that's my update for tonight. Great. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I guess for the, the chair's update, I would just say that um, we, there, it's, we, as you may recall, in the four town meeting, we had um, a broad agreement from the four towns to have a two-year regional assessment agreement, and um, I just think the committee should be apprised that um, 
it hasn't taken more than a couple of months for there to continue to be rumblings in various places around what the what people in the town, what feedback people in the town are going to be giving their uh, select boards and finance committees and town meetings around the regional assessments. And so um, based on everything I think I've heard and that the superintendents heard and the finance directors heard, it looks like things are going to still move forward in all the towns with affirmative votes. And uh, we have still have support, you know, as was agreed from the select boards and finance committees. But if, if you hear something, um, actually what I would say is this, if you hear something from a neighbor or a friend or if something pops up in the Gazette or online um, about um, funding for our schools and what the budget's going to look like and all that, um, all, all the people who were at the four town meetings are still working together collaboratively and hard to try to make sure that we see through the agreement we made. People recognize this is a really difficult thing to do and that it impacts the bottom line of all of our towns, you know, very significantly. So nobody likes property tax increases, nobody likes tight budgets, and it's why we have the advocacy item, among other reasons, later in the discussion, because there's a real problem we have with um, school funding in general. So my, you know, my thought is that if you're, if you're a resident out there and you're listening, I really feel deeply that our committee and the other committees we've worked with get the idea that we're under a lot of fiscal strain and take seriously what we're asking taxpayers to contribute for our schools. Um, and, but, it's, but it's hard. But it, as I said, everyone's hanging together right now to fulfill the commitment that was made at the four town meetings. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I think it's, it's a preview, honestly, of what, of what I said to all, to all to not all of you, but some of you, after the meeting at the regional, the four town meeting, I said, well, you know, this is just going to come back up again by next December or January. <laughs> We'd love a two-year agreement, but I just don't buy it. I don't believe that's going to happen. And this is sort of, to me, a reminder of the fact that it, that whatever, you know, Sean and uh, Doc, Mr. Mangano and Dr. Morris can think of and whatever we can do together to sort of continue an affirmative conversation with the other towns is probably a good idea to do just so that we can maintain the good feeling that we're starting to develop with one another about how we can all hang together in support of our schools, but it could be a rough ride. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. No, I think I think you captured. Okay, that. great. I'll just continue to update the committee after each town meeting about how it went, and if there's uh, unforeseen development, uh, we may have to get back together to talk about it. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, so speaking of this, we're staying on financial issues, and uh, is this a mistake that you're actually? on early in the agenda instead of toward the end? The sun's out. That's bizarre. It's like, uh, it's like I'm usually, it's dark out back there. Now, what's the sun in our budget? There's got to be sun here, too. Right? Yeah, it's, it's in good shape right now. Uh, so this is the quarter three um, budget report for the region. Um, after nine months, the Amherst Pelham Regional School District budget is projected to finish under budget due to savings in tuitions and health insurances. Um, there haven't been a tremendous number of changes since the last quarter report, but I'll point those out as we go through. So payroll is tracking over budget by 103,000 uh, due to the following. Um, the middle school principal model, as we discussed last time, uh, was more uh, costly than anticipated um, because we went from a uh, self-insured trust fund to Maya, the, the support we used to get for business office staff and HR staff from the health insurance trust fund, that went away. That's the second bullet point. Um, so that was a $27,000 cost. Uh, additional ELL support, 0.55 FTE, totaling $42,000. So that was hired. I think that was in response to some of our SLIFE needs um, at the high school and middle school level. Yep. Um, that, that one's a new one since last time. Um, special education is a group in terms of, pay, in, in the payroll section, is 176000 over due to the following. So this is sort of a sub subgroup of, of payroll. Um, we have some unfilled positions, which are uh, promoting savings, 141000 Those positions are instructional coach. Um, a BCBA position and a physical thera therapist position. Uh, the instructional coach, we just we changed the model, and if you remember, that's actually a position we cut in, in next year's budget. Um, the BCBA and physical therapist were positions that we weren't able to fill early on, so we contracted those out this year. Um, we have a new, this is new from last time, a new part-time adjustment counselor at the high school, 37,000, and that's in line with an add to the next year's budget. Um, so it's started early, and then it's in next year's budget as well. Um, 
at the elementary level, you heard about this. We uh, shifted the IDA grant around this year. Instead of funding salaries, we're funding tuitions. So a shift of approximately $230,000 of employee salaries that were on the IDA grant have come back to payroll. Um, so payroll's over budget, but it's sort of not really over budget because we moved this $230,000 off of the grant and then shifted that down to the special ed tuition section. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then also we have three additional paraeducators at Summit Academy for a total of $50,000. And then the last payroll item, uh, staff turnover um, savings, about $170,000 worth of staff turnover savings and some other adjustments that have happened this year. We've had a number of sort of high level positions that have just turned over and, and shuffled. Um, most noteworthy is the high school principal, facility director, um, high school assistant principal positions, and the dean positions. Um, and then we've had a number of leave of absences that have been filled to tempor temporary staff as well. So that's the payroll section. Um, going to expense accounts, so special education is tracking under budget um, due in large part to a couple things. So the first one is our special education costs for uh, out district tuitions actually rose this year, even though it's a little contradictory because it's under budget. Um, they actually rose this year and we believe we are eligible for what's called extraordinary relief aid. So it's a, it's a part of circuit breaker where if your costs rise, I believe it's 125% um, from the year before, you get this additional one-time reimbursement. Um, so that additional re one-time reimbursement has been calculated and it's factored in here. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. You just used the phrase, we believe we're eligible. When will you find out if we are? So we've submitted, everything shows that we're eligible, and now it's, we're just waiting to see if we, um, to, it depends on what other claims are out in the state. We believe we're going to get something. The, if we get the full amount, it depends on what other, um, what other districts have for claims on that. Okay. Um, then in addition, so those funds, if, if we get the full amount, it's about $140,000. Um, and we were, we did get that once before about three or four years ago. Um, and then as noted in the payroll section, $230,000 of expenses have been shifted out of the tuition section onto the IDA grant. So we had um, the payroll came off the IDA grant, went into payroll, and then these tuitions came out of the general fund and went onto the grant. Um, again, the reason we did that was um, it, it frees up more of the grant when we don't have to pay payroll from it because we don't have to earmark the retirement portion. Um, so overall, expenditures have exceeded the original budget, but due to um, the extraordinary relief aid and this grant adjustment, it, it appears under budget. Enrollments in charter schools, vocational schools, and other public schools are much lower than expected. Um, shown in the charts below, this is mostly the same from last time. So we're under 12 charter school students from what we budgeted. Um, we had 93 in FY18. We projected 107 when we did sort of the cascade of students going up a grade level um, and then estimating what seventh grade would look like. And basically, we stayed pretty flat, actually, with FY18. Um, the, one of the, the bigger surprises is if you look from F eighth grade and FY19 to or, um, what we projected for eight, uh, sorry, what we projected for ninth grade and FY19 to what actually happened in, in ninth grade, um, we're about four students less. So there's definitely this... Uh, movement back to the high school um, from eighth grade to ninth grade when kids, when charter school students go to that ninth grade level. Um, and we've seen that a couple years in a row now, so we're going to have to somehow try to quantify that and factor that into our projections. Uh, vocational enrollment, we saw another large drop. So we had 40.65 students in FY18. We budgeted 39 in FY19, and we actually only have 31 and a half. Um, again, we saw a um, much lower ninth grade enrollment, and then we saw some other grade levels, some students come back to us or, or leave the vocational school altogether. And then lastly, to complete the trifecta, school choice also came in lower. Um, we had 24 students in FY18. We rolled that over for FY19, um, stayed flat, and our actual number uh, as of Q2 was 18 students. So that came in um, six students under budget. So there was one little, you'll see this in the budget transfer section, there is a little bit of additional savings in the tuition section, um, which is called other programs. Um, the charter tuition rate ca came down a little bit from what it was in Q2. They, it's a preliminary rate in Q2. They give us an actual rate for the Q3 report, and so that tuition rate came down a little bit, so there's a little bit more savings there. Can I, can I ask a dumb question? Yeah. That's, I, I should already know the answer to this, and I don't, so I'm just going to ask it, as embarrassing as that is to say. Um, so we have... If you anticipate a certain amount of, whether it's choice, vocational, or charter, so it could be any of them, um, enrollment, mm -hmm. and then we come under that enrollment amount and we have money, excess money than we thought we'd have available, 
Um, because we're a regional district and not, I know in an individual town, that money would likely roll back into the general fund of the town yeah. at the end of the year. Are we able to bank some of that money? Yes. And, and yeah. I'm asking that question because I kind of wouldn't want to be, I mean, I understand you got to figure out how to figure out what the enrollments are going to look like in the future. Yeah. But one of the challenges would be if you get it wrong, like if you say to yourself, you know, this is this is definitely a secular trend and we're going to keep this thing going. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it doesn't for, for whatever reason beyond anyone's mm -hmm. imagination. Then like you're out, you're out of a lot of money. Right. On the other hand, if you if you do continue a sort of a conservative estimate or projections and assuming it's not radical, right? Because right. you wouldn't want to be overcharging the towns right. by a lot of money. Yeah. But if there was a little bit of a delta and you're able to bank it and then spend it forward, you know what I mean? Yeah. Is yeah. That so possible? this, like other accounts, any savings here, um, if it's not used for other um, other uses during the year, would go into our E and D account at the end of the year. But how do you, I mean, how do we budget? Do you, I mean, I know we're. I guess the reason I'm asking this question, I know we're also conservative. Yeah. About how we budget use of the E and D fund. Right. Yeah. So you, we'll talk about this in a little bit. For FY twenty. The use of the ND fund we ticked up a little bit because we knew we had these additional savings. Yeah. Um, some of that's a one-time thing that's going to come back down. But yeah, when we so when we determine what we're going to use for the following year ND to support the budget, part of that's based on how this year looks and what we're going to put back into ND. Um, so yeah, these savings do get banked into our ND fund. We're capped on that, so it's not like it's not like we can bank that and it can just grow indefinitely. We have to stay below the five percent um, for ND, so we have to use. Basically, anything we think we're going to be close to that 5%, we have to use it. Interesting. The ND fund is a stabilization account? Um, not exactly. It's, a, it's, it's sort of like a town's free cash, um, but regional school districts are only allowed to have 5% of their operating budget and capital budget combined. So for us, it's somewhere in the $1.6 million range is the, the max we can have. And anything above that, if you had a surplus that exceeded that amount, it has to go back to the towns. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. So uh, utilities are tracking under budget by $65,000 due to savings in heating costs. Um, the surplus may grow as we anticipate further savings in our electric bill this spring from net metering credits. So we think we're going to have additional savings. This is the first time we're seeing what the net metering credits look like in the spring. So for the winter, the net metering credits kind of go away because you're not generating much electricity from the solar, uh, from the solar panels. Um, so our net metering credits sort of flatlined. And now we're going to see what they look like as the as the months get warmer and April, May, and June come around. So we think that number is going to grow a little bit as we go forward. Uh, risk and benefits are tracking significantly under budget due to changes in health insurance enrollment patterns, um, the suspension of the health insurance surcharge, and lower liability insurance rates and lower unemployment costs. So pretty much everything's trending well there. Um, so you can see the snapshot below of health insurance enrollment. So we had 249 plans last October. We budgeted 251 for FY19. And we dropped about 20 plans from what we budgeted. Um, and in addition to dropping those plans, we shifted pretty significantly from PPOs to HMOs, which are less expensive. Um, and all that's been factored into next year's budgeting, which is why next year's budget was in good shape. Uh, the surcharge going away six months into the year equates to um, about $200,000 of additional savings. So we had that sort of surcharge piece, which is roughly between 10 and 20 percent. Um, we thought it could last up to two years, and it went away after six months. So that's some additional savings. Um, we also lowered our liability insurance because we did a competitive quote process. Um, we did it in conjunction with the town, um, but we got a lower quote from our existing vendor, the one that we've had up until this year, and they got a lower quote from somebody else. So we actually have a different insurance provider right now than the town, which is sort of a pain at times because before we could call the same person no matter what happened at any of the schools, and now we call different people depending on what school it's happening at. So, um, but it's, it's worth it, I think, for the price. Um, and then unemployment insurance costs are tracking $45,000 lower, lower than expected, which is a little surprising because um, we did have a large number of cuts last year. So you would have expected the unemployment costs to potentially be you know, at least average, um, but they're quite a bit less. And maybe that's a sign that the economy is doing well. Um, but those costs are coming in less as well. So at this point in the year, the district is on track uh, with expected savings and tuitions and health insurances. And as the year progresses, more information will become available and projections will be adjusted accordingly. And on the next, so that's the expense side of the, the picture. Um, on the next side, uh, the next page is the revenue side of the picture, which is always much more, uh, much closer in terms of budgeted and actual. Um, so you can see what we budgeted for revenue sources. 
our actuals, um, we're coming in about 0.08% higher than actual, so we're right on track. Um, chapter 70 came in a little bit higher. Charter tuition came in lower. Again, that's the offset. So if our charter enrollment comes in lower, our expenses are lower, but then we get less revenue as well because the, the tuition reimbursement is lower. Um, our regional transportation aid came in higher because they there was an effort last year after the budget uh, was done to push that up. Um, our Medicare Part D is sort of a, a volatile year to year that came in a little bit higher. Um, and then other miscellaneous revenue came in higher. That's always sort of, we don't budget for it because it's not a defined source every year, but we usually get something. Um, so overall, revenues are on track. Any questions on the Q3 budget report? And the transfers are on the next page. So um, there's not quite as many transfers uh, for the region because you actually approved sort of the big bulk of them at, during the Q2 presentation. So these are just the things that have sort of changed since that time. So there's some things that are just sort of projection adjustments, risk and benefits um, that, that we're projecting a little bit higher cost there. Um, utilities uh, were increasing. So um, there's overall savings in utilities, but after the second quarter adjustments, I think we assumed too much savings. So this is adjusting that down a little bit by putting some money back in there until we um, see what the net metering credits look like. Uh, student services, we have an increase in homeless and foster transportation. Um, same thing as the elementary level. It's a really hard one to project year to year. Um, we might have to have another conversation about that at some time because it's definitely a growing cost in our budget. Um, and there are some talks at the state level to provide additional funding for it, but um, it's just a hard one to, to budget for. Uh, transportation, just a little projection adjustment. Facilities, um, this is the cost, the region share of the accessibility audit, um, putting that into the facility department's lines. Um, payroll, 29945 increase. So we've had a number of positions, um, particularly custodial, that have been unfilled all year for a variety of reasons. And so we've had temporary staff um, basically working, and they get paid out of the, the contract section. So it's a the different section of the budget. Um, English language education, our, our translation costs are up a little bit for contracted um, contracting out translations. And regular education, um, we bought some new um, risers and staging for the theater department. They had some old stuff that was not as needed to be replaced, essentially. Uh, <laughs> so, so between these risers and staging and the auditorium seats, the theater department did pretty well um, this year. And then, so those are the increases in the budget, and then the decreases, um, control accounts. So many of those things were funded by um, what basically was in the reserve, the, tra the transfer um, reserve accounts, 118,000 going down. And then I mentioned earlier the charter tuition rate went down a little bit. Um, so other programs were decreasing by 26,391. And so those increases and decreases offset, and that's the proposed um, Q3 transfers. Is it honest? Just a comment, I think, uh, more for the chair and for uh, Dr. Morris. Um, there was mention made about the student services and the increase in the homeless and foster student transportation. I actually would be interested in hearing um, a little bit more at, at a future meeting about uh, this program in our schools. I think we've heard um, from a, a recent meeting with legislators mm -hmm. that a lot of communities have become concerned with the, you know, the substantial increase that we're seeing yeah. uh, as there are fewer foster families that are available to foster students and therefore the area of, uh, you know, of transportation has become yeah. a lot mm -hmm. greater, meaning that there's an increase now for transportation-related costs. So I think it would be worthwhile to have this conversation <coughs> now before things, you know, we don't know what the trend will actually be, but just to better understand the, pro the, the program that we currently have and how we might be able to help students that are in these situations. And, and, and you'd like both uh, homeless and foster? Both. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just very briefly, we'll talk about this at the end, but homelessness was on the May 28th agenda, and we could certainly, I think, for what you said, makes good sense of including the foster piece as well. Great, thank you. Yeah. Any any further questions on these? Yes, Professor. Um, just one question related, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Um, one question related to the um, Extraordinary expense. Yeah. So I just, I, I guess my question is just so I understand it fully. So it's great that we're getting these funds this year, but I'm assuming that you said they're one time. And yeah. I, it sounds like the, I, 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 is the expense going to continue on next year? And I'm assuming we've. Yeah, we've budgeted for the. In, in yeah, the we've budgeted for the increased expense for next year, and we're okay. not assuming, and we won't get it, um, extraordinary relief next year unless we have new costs. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, it's tr truly a one time sort of nice to have kind of thing, but it is, um, but we're not counting on it for next year's budget, and those costs are, now that's, again, that's not to say we might not have new placements that right. are a concern for next year, but um, the ones that generated the extraordinary relief um, are factored in. Thank you. 
Yeah. One more. Um, just on the current FY19 um, revenues, mm -hmm. um, the homeless transportation, just going back to that, it's blank. Is that? But. Um, yeah, so I'd have to look at last year. Sometimes. So what was that? Because you're saying yeah. there's an increase of about, um, what was it? It's uh, twenty five thousand. I'm just curious. If yeah, I'll double check that. Crest. It might have got rolled into. Uh, <laughs> it might have got rolled into the regional transportation number. I'll double check that. Oh, or, okay. Um, but the and I'll have to look at what our costs were last year. But overall, it's really small right now. So they used to fund hundred percent of your homeless transportation costs. Um, that got cut down to about thirty percent of your homeless transportation costs. Um, so I'll double check that. Um, and if if I need to put a number there, I'll update it and send it out to you. Okay. Just yep. curious about how the big the yeah usually it's so whatever we submit on last year's end of year report for homeless transportation we get that this year um, as a reimbursement. So I'm ass I'm assuming that on the 28th. I mean I think I sound funny about this. You always have to fi find an appropriate way to talk about yeah. how we're providing services and support for students and engaging with families so that you know you have a dollars and cents conversation but you're not treating people as dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, the reason I'm saying that only though is that I, I still think getting a good, yeah. for the committee, to get a good picture yeah. of all of this on the 28th would still be yeah, a really good idea. Mm -hmm. And we're going to trust you guys to figure out mm -hmm. how to sure. talk about it in a way <laughs> that, 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 that reflects the compassion, concern, support, and caring that we would want to show as a committee. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. 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 You don't know where the students are coming from. How could, how can there be transportation costs for homeless students? <coughs> I don't understand. Um, yeah, so, um, so homelessness is a status. It doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have shelter. Um, so when students are in that status, um, we transport them from where they are. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And the way it works just technically is it's homelessness, uh, homeless transportation in particular, is, it's always a cost share between two districts. So it's a cost share between the, the district where the student goes to school and the district where the shelter is located. Um, so there's, whenever we get those bills, there's always a, we pay 50% essentially of that cost. Great. Anything further I'd also entertain? There's on the front page uh, of the agenda, there's a motion if one is <coughs> prepared to make it under FY19 budget transfers. Sir Dunlop? I move to approve the budget transfers between cost centers as presented by Mr. Mangano. Is there a second? Second. And moved and seconded. Mr. Jones, moved by Mr. Delmon. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion carries unanimously eight to nothing. Thank you. Oh, don't go too far. <laughs> uh, MSBA update on accelerated roof repair program, arms roof. My r understanding is we are literally providing an update and not requesting any action by the committee at this point, right? That is correct. I can queue right. it up very briefly for okay. Mr. And the, the key point is there may be a future action by the committee yeah. that's anticipated, but not tonight. Yeah. yeah. So what we'd like to share just very briefly is an update we received about the Accelerator Repair Program. Just for context, if you may remember, it was voted by this body, um, a $3 million uh, assessment um, to replace the middle school roof. There was an additional motion that was passed around exploring, exploring solar as part of that process. And so we received some information that Mr. Mangano will share from MSBA that we wanted to share with you. And I think as we go through the next couple of meetings, we may want to come back and have more in-depth conversation. But this was something that was just we were made aware of at the end of last week. And so we want to share where we are and, and continue the conversation throughout the spring. Yeah. So we actually heard uh, this information from our friends at Shrewsbury uh, as they were having a visit from the MSBA on their roof um, project that the uh, threshold for the age of your roof in order to be eligible for the accelerated repair program was increased from 20 years to 27 years. And our roof, the age of our roof is about 25 years. So we haven't given, been given official notice that our um, proposal has been declined or deferred or, or whatever, um, but we're expecting that after hearing that information. And I did contact the MSBA to confirm that that was the case and they confirmed that it was increased to 27 years. Um, so that means we're unlikely to receive funding for the roof for this coming cycle. And so sort of the, the future discussion would be around, do we push forward with the roof replacement project without the MSBA funds? Um, or do we try to wait a year and resubmit? And in the meantime, again, do more patching to the roof. Um, we can complete the study about you know, what additional costs there would be to strengthen the roof to support solar. Um, we can try to do some of those pieces in the interim. Um, while we wait to resubmit for the MSBA program. 
so and the MSBA program. So let's assume the roof did come out to three million when it's all said and done. Um, the MSBA program would probably cover about sixty between fifty and sixty percent of that in that ballpark. That's a dumb question. So. We're, you say we're roughly in year 25 of the roof? Yes. If we vote it next year, is it anticipated that we wouldn't receive the award until we were into year 27 of the roof? So we accept it, or do we really have to wait two years? So they started back at, so if we flip back a year, um, they had increased the threshold last year from 20 years to 25 years of age, and they were only accepted, I think, projects that were over 25 years last year. And then to start this year, they brought it back down to 20, at least for the original submission. Yeah. And then based on how many submissions they get, they determine how far up they have to increase it. Um, so I anticipate next year, they'll start back at 20. Um, and then based on the volume of requests, they'll have to increase it to something, um, whether it's to 27 or maybe 25 or maybe they have to go to 30. I don't know. Um, it's hard to know. They said one of the responses was that the, the line item that funds the accelerator repair program was kept flat. Um, from the prior year, so they didn't receive any additional funding to be able to clear out the backlog. So they don't mean like they changed the permanent program. No, no, no. It's a it's after. more a matter of they're making annual judgment calls, yeah. and so the reason you won't apply next year is the judgment call might be right. twenty six years. And yeah. All of a sudden, we're perfect. Right. Exactly. Okay. Any any further questions? <coughs> Sorry. Yes, so I'll name? just add the last year. They bumped it to 25 years because there were 63 school districts that applied, and they bumped it to 27 this year because there were 83. So I can only imagine that next year it'll be even more than that. And Shootsbury was at 24 and a half last year when they bumped it up to 25. Mm -hmm. And then we go, now we're 25 and they bumped it to 27. Yeah. But that's that's kind of nice though, because that means they've given you a year of breathing space where you have little reason to hope. You know, if they got the 26, then they'd that's be right. like, then... next year we'll be all set. And they'd be like, oh darn it, now they've got 27. And one of the things we can bring back to the group is an assessment by the facility director and his team of how is it, what, I think can, can we, we wait, I think essentially. What, I think that's what we really need. Yeah. And I think the other thing we really need is we need to understand What's the fiscal impact on the towns yep. of, of eating the whole? I'm not saying we would do it. I'm right. just saying if you want to make an intelligible decision, you got to understand, yep. like, you know, yep. saving half over half the cost sounds like a lot of money. Yes. So okay. and we have athletic fields and all this stuff to fix, too, right? Mm -hmm. okay, Thank you. All set. Any questions? No other further questions? We move forward. Um, oh, and thank you very much. Thank you. You're done, right? <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Super, yeah, good night. <laughs> Still somewhat bright out. Uh, superintendent evaluation tool discussion. Should I like to introduce it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I'm the, currently a member of the subcommittee on the superintendent evaluation committee. So um, as planned, Debbie Westmoreland was kind enough to put um, together what's going to be going out to everybody electronically um, for the evaluation of the superintendent this year. Um, we're presenting it today so people can have a chance to review it and provide any feedback if they see anything that needs to be changed or any, have any questions. Um, but the hope was I think that we'd approve it and then at the next meeting we'll have artifacts just confirming that um, presented by the superintendent. Okay. And then we'll be using this tool in um, in several weeks to, to so, do the so actual evaluation. Forgive me, would you like to get feedback on tonight and then formally approve it next time, or do you want to I think that right? makes sense to, okay. and, unless people feel comfortable okay. approving so it So you'd today. accept I mean, the motion if, if it were forthcoming? Yeah, but I, I'm also, I think we have time to wait and okay. we'll give people more time to review it. Cool, do you want to, I mean, do you want to walk people through? Or does somebody want to in the committee? Um. I mean, so the, the DESI sets out the um, different elements and, you know, we set the goals and then this is the tool that sort of connects those elements to the, the goals. And um, I think one of the things to just, just point out here um, is the scale. Um, and again, this is set by DESI. So I think it more some of us in our evaluations would feel like proficient. It's not, you know, doing that great. But it, here, you know, they, they proficient is, you know, actually quite a high um, standard to meet, so I just want to remind people of that, um, especially the public, because I think sometimes um, in these types of evalu evaluations, you um, you really need to look at how they define each scale. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a little different than last year's, and in terms of how you look, how you score it, and things like that. No, I don't believe so. No. The, on, okay. the only difference is in exemplary, where in prior years it always had you, if you chose exemplary, that it, it was saying that Dr. Morris was able to like be the top dog in the entire state, and st where now it really speaks just to the district, where exemplary sometimes was actually hard to choose, not because of Dr. Morris, but because of what exemplary stated. So it's, it's much better this time. Interesting. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think the state adjusted language, and it's similar on the other educators, not just the superintendent rubric, but also on the teacher rubric, oh. principal rubric. Um, that was based on, they went through a rewrite of all of those rubrics. Um, RIAC actually was a part of that and still has a gripe about one of them, but not the part that Mr. <laughs> Sullivan's raising. Yeah. Um, um, so they did revisions based five years later based on feedback from... It's, it's, the, it's, that's so interesting because if you, I mean, I think everyone I've ever talked to who's done this, you know, who's filled out an evaluation, <coughs> takes it super seriously. But I have to admit um, what, what Mr. Sullivan was talking about, that, that standard of, um, you know, like there's a, there's a marble yeah. statue being carved <laughs> presently at the Harvard School of Education or something, is sort of like, it reads as a very high standard, not that you can't meet, match it, but it's just sort of like, a, it's interesting to see it altered in a way that makes exemplary sound extraordinary as opposed to unbelievably superhuman. Is, there, is somebody, Mr. Donis, are you? Linear? Yeah, I guess I was, uh, I was just looking at the definition. Um, it didn't jump out as me as much, I guess, as it did for Mr. Sullivan, uh, because it does still say proficient could serve as a model for practice regionally or statewide, but I guess maybe it's the, the word regionally or statewide that is the, the difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that was, yeah. Yeah, because it, the statewide is still there. Like, it's, it is still this, like, paragon of... But it doesn't <laughs> sound, like, before to me it sounded, you it's, know, it really said yeah. a model for the entire state, like, you were the supreme... Yeah. <laughs> Tell you, marble statue. Yes. That's <laughs> <the important. laughs> you brought it down just a shade. That's right. More like aluminum cast or something. <laughs> Uh, which the key thing is it could be recycled. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, anything further? Yeah. Menino. I'll ask. Uh, when we're filling it out, I usually pro put proficient. Mm -hmm. What are we to do in terms of deciding between proficient and exemplary? I mean, uh, I guess I don't know the difference. One thumbs up or two thumbs. Well, I mean, I think, I think, uh, I mean, one that's that that's a really hard question, right? I mean, it's because the the I think one of the challenges is what context you use to be able to decide the standard. I think to me, actually, it's very interesting to me, anyways. The last couple of years. The description in there about able to model practice was an interesting bit of language because I hate to do this in front of you because I'm not really, I'm not going to say anything specific, yeah. but it's obviously about you. So, <laughs> what, you know, what am I going to do, right? Is, is that there were some things where I could see Dr. Morris sort of working through something and I thought he did a good job and I thought it was, you know, even an excellent job. But when I saw, thought through how he was presenting what he was doing, did I say, this is like so rigorously thought through and structured and um, the way in which he did it, you know, is sort of all, not could fut be a future model or is going on the path for being a model, but it's sort of, it's just really good. And uh, then there are other things that we did, I think this is reflected on the thing I submitted last year, well, I should submit it. There are other things where I could literally look at how Dr. Morris organized things and say, my God, it already is literally a model for how other districts could execute this thing. That's kind of easy, right? Because it's, it's thinking then through that structure. But I think that's, I think the standard you bring into it yourself, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not answering that If we that grade them proficient, we're still giving them high marks. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 
I don't, I'm not going to put Dr. Morse on the spot on this, but I mean, I don't see any reason why uh, a professional in this context couldn't go through a couple of years of getting all proficient marks, um, no major demerits, and not be proud of the work that they were doing and feel like they were making excellent professional advancement as, as a superintendent as an individual. I mean, I think the challenge, actually, in fact, I think that when you look at the definitions, one of the challenges you have, and this is something that uh, Ms. Spitzer was bringing up at the very beginning, and I think it's a really important point we should bring up at the beginning, is that if, if let's take of argument, if you, for example, Ms. Reno, you know, really liked the job that Dr. Morris is doing on something, you might feel the urge to give an exemplary because you think it's expressing enthusiasm as opposed to a strict adherence to the language that's on here. And ideally, the le there are other areas where there are boxes where you can provide written comments, where if you thought, for example, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. No, no. I'm just saying as an example, if you looked at something and you thought Dr. Morris was, was really a solid superintendent, AKA proficient, but you were enthusiastic about something he did, there's a place you can put that in and, and make a comment of the way you handle X, Y, and Z, I thought was really, really terrific. And by the way, it also doesn't prevent you, because we did this last year, of, of writing in your proficient in an area and then writing in the comments. But by the way, as I'm looking forward to next year, there's, there's this, this, and this where I feel like you, you know, we should think about this because it's something that could be, you know, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah. Uh, clarification. I sort of remember last year that if we gave them an exemplary rating, we had to put a narrative in a box as to why we gave it an, ex uh, an exemplary rating. Is that the case this year? Mm -hmm. Anything but proficient you, is required to, you have to give a response as to why. But it doesn't prevent but, you from making a comment if it is proficient. You have to make an explanation if you do the others. But if it's proficient, you can still make a comment about your reasoning or thinking. And, and obviously, the, the, this is where the, I mean, it, you, I'm sure you remember from la last year, the, uh, that pile of artifacts is like really, really dense. And there are links on everything. And if you, I'm sure everyone did, but I'm just saying if you take the time to click through them all, there's like gobs and gobs of stuff to look through and to reason through and make your own judgment. It was probably exhausting, this topic. Are there comments that people want to make or... I, just, I have one yes, more, of since this is the, the fifth time for me, that I just want to remind the committee and also the public that we chose what to um, grade the superintendent on in the, in the fall, and that uh, we have to stick to what's on here. There's no freelancing, and we're not um, great at looking at anything but what is, was, is on the evaluation. Which corresponds also, I mean, I should say, if, if you do your job, right. it corresponds <laughs> to what's submitted to the art, artifacts, meaning literally there's a correspondence right. to the body of evidence, you submit the instrument you've developed, the goals that were set earlier, and then that's the that's the focus, right? Mr. Delman, you had your hand raised. Yeah, just um, briefly, that um, so I appreciate that the committee, that uh, all the work the subcommittee has done, it builds on the work of the previous yeah. So, could, which has gotten us to a, a really excellent place in terms of having a tool we can all use. I think it's it's um, it's really interesting, you know, this this discussion that I don't think has a definitive answer about, you know, the the evaluation tool can get so quantifiable and try and identify exactly what proficient and exemplary means. But at the end of the day, it's up to our personal interpretations of how to apply that, yeah. and we have a lot of freedom to do that. That's yes. it's our evaluation. It's a public facing document. Um, and I thought one of the more enlightening things of the evaluation process last year was seeing how different members approached that mm -hmm. um, and how the, the sum was greater than mm -hmm. the, the constituent parts. Um, so you know, it's just it's interesting how you can, you can try and quantify it, but at the end of the day, there's this, you know, I wouldn't say like a, a special sauce about it, but there is some sort of creativity, personal approach to it. Absolutely. Yeah, and by the way, the, uh, forgive me, I don't know why I did this, since, I w since the, we were asked a question around how to make these judgments. I thought I'd offer an answer, at least on my perspective. But the reason I looked around the table is because, reasonably speaking, we could have eight different, at this part table, eight different views on how to do that within the framework that we are given. And that's obviously very appropriate. And actually, I should remind people 
of what you, I think, hopefully already remember, is that we had also previously agreed that when the, uh, the, the summary evaluation document is done at the end, one of the things we're trying to do is even if we're even as we're following sort of the the the, the numerical sort of mean or how it reaches different grades numerically, um, we talked about trying to make sure that we included a description of the of the range of responses and a sort of a coloration of some of the views that were submitted. So that even though obviously Dr. Morris is, is able to read every single evaluation, and I'm sure he does, um, even the summary document is not intended to wash out the diversity of this group, but is genuinely trying to pull it all together and encompass it, um, which, which I think is a good thing. Even better, we already agreed to do it. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> yes, it's Cass and Simmons, and then Zayn is. I have one quick comment. Um, Thank you. This is great, and I um, I feel like we're sort of now really hitting our stride in terms of setting the goals at a good time during the year, early in the year. Um, I wonder if going forward, the um, superintendent evaluation subcommittee could consider sort of as soon as the goals are set, starting to compile this artifact, so that during the um, periodic superintendent goal updates. Um, the committee could sort of think about those updates in terms of this language that they're going to be evaluating on later in the year, so that's just very ingrained and familiar. Um, there should be a suggestion. Is it nice? I think it's a great idea. <laughs> um, and I also just wanted to check in on the, uh, so looking at the, the handouts the committee got for proposed agenda topics, we have a superintendent evaluation artifacts presentation May 14. Um, we haven't yet voted on this tool, so are we then thinking that we would vote on that tool, on this tool, on that date, in addition to receiving the artifacts? Um, I guess we could potentially do that, but we could vote today, or if, if people are comfortable with it, or we could, if people want more time, I think we could wait. And I'm realizing I may be speaking out of turn. No, you're not. Okay. Well, you <laughs> technically you are. But yeah. I'm not going to nod my head this direction. So <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just thinking back to the minutes of the last meeting, and we had said that um, um, May 14th we'll share artifacts and vote on the evaluation instruments. So that was the original plan. Um, are still at that. Do you have an opinion? I guess I'm saying I, I'm I'm happy to vote on this tool tonight. I feel like we've talked about it before, and this isn't. It, it's a great. You guys have done a fantastic job putting it together. Um, I don't see any reason not to vote it, and then you know that hopefully gives Miss Westmoreland time. Um, I'm looking over in Sasha's direction. I'm sorry, I'm so used to having Miss Westmoreland over here. Um, give her time to you know upload the the tool and fix any you know tweak it if necessary. So, so under Robert's rules of order, you can't make a motion after you talk, but I can recognize someone right now to make a motion. Would you like to be recognized? I would like to be recognized. Okay. <laughs> Um, I would like to move to approve the 2018-2019 uh, end of cycle summative evaluation report tool as presented to the committee tonight. Is there a second? It's been moved by Ms. Adonia, seconded by Mr. Medina. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify aye. It carries unanimously for nothing. Uh, by the way, going forward, Ms. Spitzer is going to be chair of the subcommittee. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing a great job. <laughs> Should be. Ms. Ms. We all Ms. Westmoreland did all the hard work. <laughs> uh, okay. Policy JICFC. Student to student harassment, third read possible vote. There's a motion in the packet. Um, is there any presentation around any changes, or is there no changes, or where are we sitting on this? I can um, speak to this and anybody else from the subcommittee um, if you want to jump in if I um, leave something out. Um, but the just to give a little bit of background. We started this, I think, 
even before my time on the school committee, <laughs> um, a year ago. Um, and then it took us a long time to organize um, a, our policy subcommittee, and so we've been looking at this. The last time that we talked about this at the regional, the full committee, um, we had questions about other classes or, dis or um, of, of population that we wanted to specifically call out or not call out in this particular policy, and we had questions around that. We've since um, gotten the legal, sort of written legal advice on this particular policy, which is also included in the packet, and which we as the subcommittee reviewed at um, our last meeting at the beginning of this, of, of this month. Um, we opted to go with the attorney's recommendation on this. Um, we actually even, so since the last reading, the only change that we've really made is that we've reordered the list of classes so that it's identical to what the attorney was recommending just to make it easier for ourselves to track and make sure that we had everything that they were recommending and um, hadn't left anything out. Um, the only clarification that we made um, that is different than their recommendation is, um, so I'll just read the classes, which is um, on the basis of race, religion, color, national origin, in parentheses, ancestry, disability, criminal record, or sex, gender. And this is the addition that we made, which is including sexual orientation and gender identity. And I don't know if folks had a chance to read the attorney's recommendation, um, uh, but the, the, to sum it up was the recommendation was for us to not to detail um, individuals or populations that are not actually legally protected classes of individuals um, because we'd be affording rights that aren't specific. There is no precedent legally for how to um, address that particular harassment. And the advice was that in many cases, um, the behavior is and can be covered under some of our other policies, including our anti-bullying policy. Um, and so the recommendation was to, to address the behaviors that we want to address through those other policies and not through this policy. Did that cover the conversation? Yes. Can I just um, point out one thing? Because when we had the open discussion um, last time, um, I believe, at least I was one of the folks on the committee who raised the issue around national origin, and we had specifically a question of whether or not that included undocumented students, and I just want to point out that part of the reason I was comfortable with not calling out explicitly undocumented students was because we did get a, um, the attorney's letter um, states, you know, although an undocumented student would like to be able to claim protection based on national origin. So that was why I felt comfortable not calling that out. Um, I just wanted to show it because I think others on the committee were also concerned about mm -hmm. that class of students. Great. So were there, are there questions or comments? Okay. Mr. Sullivan. I'd just like to thank Ms. Cunningham. She's the one that brought this forward to the policy subcommittee two Septembers ago now. Great. Um, so... If there are not at the moment any additional questions or comments, would we I'd entertain a motion as is present on the agenda? Anyone else to be recognized? I'll move to approve policy JICFC student to student harassments as presented. Okay. Is there a second? Second. So moved and seconded. If there's any further discussion, I guess one question I have is for Dr. Morris um, is there any sense on how this would be? distributed to students or students have been made aware of it or is there any way beyond <coughs> sort of the negative way <laughs> yeah. if something happens and then oh wait there's a policy about it I'm just I'm just curious how what happens next to something like this sure so um, what would happen in this particular instance is we look at the guidelines that previously existed for the policy mm -hmm. and make any necessary adjustments and to be reflected in the student handbook okay. which is a typical way kind of policies around student, student harassment um, we don't like, you know, send an email like, hey, don't do this now. Right. It's um, not yeah, that you were no, suggesting I'm trying to make a light moment. But, asking, yeah. yeah but so um, what happens is next year's handbook would have this <coughs> the changes reflected in it. Right. Okay. And you I remember some policies at UMass that were never known to the students. How often is the student handbook published? How is it distributed? 
It's uh, every year. It's edited and updated. It's distributed at the secondary level for students who are new to the school, which is the bulk of them are seventh and ninth grade students in the fall. The other students get an electronic link and it's posted on our website as well. So we try to conserve paper when we can, but we also feel like, you know, when students enter a school, they should actually have a hard copy of it. Right. Yep. Just yes. a follow-up question for the subcommittee, I guess. Uh, the last line of that paragraph that we were referring to previously about uh, status as homeless or undocumented, it says that the rights afforded homeless and undocumented students could, however, be protected under policies addressing enrollment. And I was just curious if the subcommittee has, I guess, sort of cross-referenced uh, <coughs> those existing policies, you know, or had a discussion around how to strengthen those, because I still, you know, even though I, f I feel that I can vote for this policy with the changes recommend as recommended by the attorney, I'm still uh, a bit uncomfortable, I guess, that we, we're not calling out these uh, statuses as we had discussed in our previous discussion. I think they're critically important. So if there's some other way for us to come around to making sure that we are highlighting and strengthening, if, if necessary, or if we can, existing policies as the attorney recommends, then that would make me feel better about that. So I don't know if you did discuss it or if one could say, uh, will you look into it? I, yeah. Well, we didn't look into the policies coming out of this um, related to enrollment. We, what we're finding is that it's kind of a Pandora's box. When you start touching one policy, it leads to uh, potentially a whole bunch of other policies. And I would just like to say that um, I shared your concern about um, calling out undocumented, especially because at least Amherst is, we consider ourselves a sanctuary mm -hmm. town or city. Um, I'm, not sure I, I'm not sure which one we use now. but um, So I would be, I would welcome the chance to do that in the policy subcommittee if others would be interested in it. And I do think, I mean, I, I think it's something for the larger committee, though, to have a conversation about is do we want to, I think we'd want instruction from the larger committee that yes, we want to call out um, these classes if it's undocumented or if it's another class, and we because it does take such a it's it's a bit of a taking a step outside of what we're um, there's precedent to do in a way, or at least a substantial precedent to do, and so I think it's something that at this anybody here who is also on the subcommittee feel free to intervene or, or add on, but I think we kind of felt like on the subcommittee didn't have the power or didn't feel like we had the authority to go ahead and decide, yes, we want to protect this class of folks and we're going to call it out. So I think we'd want to make sure to have feedback from the broader committee before we made any big changes like that. Um, I, I will say we taught, we did look at the, the bullying policy mm -hmm. um, So because, because of that reference um, from the attorney and we talked about that um, and, and looked at the behaviors there. Um, we did not look or discuss the enrollment um, policy. Um, that doesn't specifically address harassment, which is the mm -hmm. topic of this particular policy, um, as, as I recall. But um, building on what Ms. Spitzer just said is one of the things that we have on our, on our docket, and I was um, uh, wanted to lead into that, was to go through our entire policy book <laughs> and, and classify some. It had been done, I think, a couple of years ago, sort of detailing all the policies that, um, just listing them out and when they were last updated or looked at and sort of set our own, our policy subcommittee policy handbook, if you will, <laughs> for how we wanted to approach these and how we make decisions about which ones we're going to be reviewing mm -hmm. And revising because it it's a massive massive undertaking and in theory it's something that we're supposed to be doing every year which is just impractical it's uh, <laughs> so you know so um, I think you know Ms. Spitzer referred to it as a Pandora's box and it really is um, and, it, and it's hard to sort of wind your way through it um, but we did look at to answer your specific question we did talk about the bullying policy which is referenced in, in this anti-harassment policy, and we can talk about taking a look at the enrollment policy as well, if that's what the full committee would like us to do. Dr. Moore? Just very briefly, uh, I haven't been to these policy subcommittee meetings, so I, I'm not, I'm commenting myself, I'm not commenting at all for any connection to those um, subcommittee meetings, but kind of the two cases I know relatively well, uh, both from California, um, two things to note. One is the national origin didn't cover, did cover, um, 
suits with an undocumented status, and, and there's kind of one really well-known one. And the second is that often bullying goes hand in hand in those situations. So I think reviewing that, even if it's just not to bring to the full committee, but just to make sure, and it seems like you already have done that, um, because um, there's been ones where even, it doesn't have to be that a student is, I'll say this well, it can be the perception or the intent of the harasser around national origin, even if, in fact, the student may not be from national origin that's different from the victim and the, you know, the harasser may have the same national origin, but if there's a perception of a difference, that's enough to justify um, a harassment claim. Which, um, which makes a lot of, I mean, as somebody who had my national origin questioned when I was young right. uh, in the Amherst School District as a, an, an ex of minor bullying, um, of course. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> as a matter of fact, some of the some of the most obvious harassment that happens against people based on their uh, ethnicity or race is based on that kind of ignorance. Um, the um, you know, although the interesting thing about undocumented students, which is interesting for the school committee and for the district, is that from from our perspective, we don't ask students about their documentation status, and so. There's an interesting element to which you have, you have anti-bullying and you have concerns about people being harassed, which is a different thing than the idea that the district would take an interest in determining whether, I mean, if you know what I'm getting at, if you go down this rabbit hole, all of a sudden you're trying to figure out whether you're going to charge someone with bias based on documentation status, well, you'd have to verify it, wouldn't you, in order to do that, and we're not going to do that, um, which, which, I'm setting, I'm setting aside the question of whether the committee looks at this. I think that's. I think you have to set your own agenda to figure out what's on your plate and what you have to get done. I think it's certainly reasonable to look at some of these things. But what it pulls me back to wondering is if before the end of the year, because we could do this out of sequence, we could do one meeting on homelessness and foster students, and and I don't want to freight this too much, but one aspect of that conversation is actually about the socialization and acculturation of students who may be either may be transient or may be undergoing very significant personal experiences that um, make it hard for them to focus in school, make it hard for them to develop friends and to, and to be you know, f you know, feeling welcome and fitting in the environment that we have in our schools. And so figuring out what we can learn about that, mm -hmm. aside from the policies, in other words, if you separate out the policies, right. how are the kids doing, right? right. And are, are they experience, are, are there challenges that we're facing, in fact, around kids feeling um, ostracized or unwelcome? Not, I mean, it's one thing because you might feel anxious. It's another thing if someone else near you is making you feel anxious, right? right. And it'd be interesting to know, without getting into the details of the individuals, it'd be interested in knowing what the actual experience is. And then the second thing is because we've actually, like annually, our committee's taken an interest in what's going on with the immigration debate, what's going on with families in our community, what's going on with students in our schools and how do we support them. It might be a welcome time at some point before the end of the year to understand what have we done this past year? How's it going? What's the experience? Mm -hmm. are, there ex are there changes or not? Are there changes in the experience that are occurring in our school where some perceived bias-based incidents actually have occurred? Have they occurred? Right. I mean, so again, I'm setting aside the policy and saying it would be interested in knowing what's actually happening and how are we addressing it. And then I remember a year ago, one of the discussions we had is you sort of told the, the committee, hey, here's what we're doing this summer, both to support families directly during the summer, but also in preparation for the fall. I think it'd be awesome to hear that same question answered mm -hmm. going into this summer and fall. Yeah. Make sense? Is there anything else on this? Did we vote yet? No, we did. No, we didn't vote. No. You want to? Motion on the You table. moved on. I know. I'm just looking around. People want to. I guess they do. Um, all those in favor of approving policy JICFC -J as presented, please signify by raising your hand. Okay. As it carries eight to nothing. Unanimous. Okay. Policy J.I. Student Rights and Responsibilities, first reading and discussion, which is to say we will not be voting on this tonight. Yeah. And this one, I think, um, definitely, oh, oh, 
tee it up, but um, welcome uh, advice, because I know Ms. Castens and you, you had some conversations on this one as well. So um, this was on our list um, of very old policies that we wanted to put review again versus um, current recommended policies or similar policies. Um, this one was last looked at in 1983. Um, so what we are proposing, the, the edit that you have here, is actually the, the MASC um, templated um, uh, policy for students' rights and responsibilities. So we, and this is where we you know, really went down the rabbit hole of looking at what all of our other policies and for many of these other rights and responsibilities that are outlined here, we have other policies that cover this particular um, concept or activity or idea. So we wanted to trim this down to, one, eliminate that overlap of, of concepts so that we didn't have, um, to reduce the potential for conflicting statements in our, in our own policy handbook and really clean it up and tighten it up um, as we brought this forward into the 21st century. Um, so do you want to Yeah, I mean, this looks really different um, from what was there. This was an old policy. I think it was from the 1980s. Um, looks like 80, yeah, 83. Um, so I briefly met with Dr. Morris and Debbie um, at that time, I mean, I think we felt like, so this policy tracks a little more closely, uh, much more closely, the uh, MASC template, for example. Um, I think sometimes, and Dr. Morris felt this way too, if, if rights are more generally enumerated, it's kind of almost, it's more protecting of them because when they're too specifically enumerated, there could be a, a, a perception that if it's not, if it's not, enumerated that it's not a right. Mm -hmm. um, and so since so many of these are addressed in other policies, um, I do feel that this is a cleaner way of um, protecting the core rights of students. Ms. Marina? If you were to summarize the major change you made to the document, what would that change be? I mean, I so we went sort of through the what was enumerated. Um, I would say the lion's share of those enumerated rights were encompassed by um, the the new rights that you see enumerated here, one through five. Um, so I, I don't think there was anything that was particularly removed exactly, but they're just more uh, broadly in, encompassed in these new uh, bullets. So I think uh, much like the earlier discussion with this one, much more so than actually the first policy I should suggest, would uh, require a major rewrite to the guidelines that um, the district staff write mm -hmm. in response to policies. Um, this is this just very bluntly, in my opinion, the existing policy looks much more like a, a guideline and procedure than it does a policy. So we would have some work to do about how to capture the kind of spirit of what is the text that's being lost into more operational language. I'm not weighing in on good, bad, but just I think this substantial rewrite would require a substantial rewrite of the guidelines. So um, to follow that forward, the introduction to this topic was that some of the element, most of the elements in here where they are more specific are, are referenced in other policies that have already been created. But does that mean because this particularly is like a, at this point, currently before this is voted, a um, really detailed description of rights and responsibilities, the existing sort of student guide um, sort of cuts and pastes a lot of this and includes it as a framework. And as an operational matter, if we move to this more general statement of rights, you'd have to go through a more detailed process of enumerating the functionality of some of these elements in ways that might mimic the current language? That's exactly correct. Okay. That just took care of my question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's all good. The, uh, all right. Any other questions? Are there, so is the, um, I guess the committee I guess people on the committee know how to find that committee. So if something burns, do you have a share? Yes. Awesome. So you, what you can do is if something pops into your head after this meeting, 
don't write it to all of us, write it to Ms. McDonald. And, and she, our, yeah, our next um, subcommittee meeting is on Monday, May 6th, whatever that. May 6th, okay. May 6th. That's Monday. Yeah. So, that's Monday. so before, ideally before Monday. I'm just saying, so we're not, because we have to move on. <laughs> no one seems to have anything to say. But if you come up with something, you know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, 815. Strategic planning update. Item 7G. Yeah, and this that would be us right now early. Great. And I'll, I'll, I think it'll be brief because um, really this is just um, setting a, a segue to the next meeting where there will be a much more substantial discussion and presentation. Um, I wanted to share and publicly thank all the members of the strategic planning team. They spent over 30 hours over the course of the year um, working on this. And I think just wanted to summarize some of the work and then to preview what's to come two weeks from now. Um, so it was uh, all, all members of the strategic planning team uh, contributed to receiving robust community feedback. So there was um, kind of electronic <coughs> tools that went out. And in addition to those tools, they went to their micro communities and gathered feedback and then brought it back. Some of that was paper and pencil. Some of that was just sharing the link. So we got substantial feedback from the larger community uh, about what they envisioned for the regional schools moving forward. Uh, we participated in a multi-stage uh, Back to the Future protocol to think about what the district wants to be four to five years from now, what we envision for that, uh, then backtracking to where we are and telling the story of how we got from where we are now to where that place is. And that sounds simple. It's incredibly complex to do that with a group of 30, 35 people, um, including students, community members, parents, guardians, staff, and administrators. But um, it was a really uh, robust activity to do um, to get, you know, because you have to sort of think big. And then you talked about where you are now, and it, everyone has different current realities. It's not to say that everyone experiences our regional district exactly the same, and that emerged as, as a major theme. Uh, and thank goodness we have the young people because they were outstanding. So I want to put a special <coughs> acknowledgement to them. We took those two pieces of feedback, both the, the uh, substantial probably eight hours of time doing that, involved in that protocol, um, the many hundred responses that we got from our tool, our electronic tool, uh, put those together and tried to figure out what are root causes of some of the challenges. What are root causes that are um, the delta between where we are now and where we want to be in the future. Uh, we did a SWOT analysis along the way, which is about strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and really where we are now is we have um, kind of the document you'll see two weeks from now has three major items. So one is strategic objectives, uh, and those are a coherent group of overarching goals um, and levers for improvement. So that's kind of like at the 30,000 foot level of um, uh, uh, and the, that's what in this process we'll, we'll use objectives. The second is our initiatives. So if you have objectives, you need ways to get to those objectives. And the last is, a, is outcomes. So what would, how would we know if we were getting there? And what we'll bring next time, what I'll bring next time is a flow chart of those three items and how kind of you have the objectives, the initiatives, and the outcomes. I want to be clear that the outcomes at this point are not in the um, smart format of goals. Really what the strategic planning team collectively decided is we'd like, they wanted me to bring that. Some of them may come um, two weeks from tonight. Um, <coughs> just to hear the like, like some of them asked if they could speak during a couple of comments, which I assume they're members of the public. Um, and really have a, um, a discussion and then eventually an endorsement of those outcomes. And then we would take the next step, which is writing them into a smart format that could be um, kind of layered within a multi-year process. But uh, the group collectively felt like before we did that work, we really wanted the school committee's endorsement because it didn't it felt like wrong sequence to do that level of detailed work without the school committee being on board. So uh, we'll get that in the packet next time so people have uh, at least a few days between when the packet goes out and the next school committee meeting um, to share that with you so that you can review it and ask any questions of me or bring questions to the meeting. Um, but that, that's sort of where we are, so we'd like to present that next time and then uh, have an endorsement or a vote, and then we'll do that last phase of work of kind of itemizing the initiatives and the outcomes over a kind of three- to five-year period. When do you think that would, when, what's the plan or window for when that activity would occur? The, um, the more specific SMART goals? The writing of that, yeah. Yeah, so we, we feel like we could have that done by the fall for sure, if not sooner. Yeah. Um, some of it depends a little on availability of people. Once we get to June, it's a little so harder to get the broad representation that we've had. Just um, one more question. Yeah, the, so then if we're 
I don't want to presuppose the next meeting, but assuming for the sake of argument that the committee is excited about the different <laughs> great, greater objectives that are set, um, how would you view the interplay between the committee trying to work <coughs> with you on superintendent goals as soon as the end of June and the desire to align those goals with these more specific <coughs> SMART goals? Yeah, I think that's very doable. I do think, um, while not in the SMART format, I think it's pretty clear what the intent of the outcomes, the initiatives, and the objectives are. So I, I, I think we can have that conversation next meeting, but I do think it's it's really just laying out the sort of what might be the artifacts or, or markers along the way, but the, the outcomes themselves, um, I think we, the group worked collectively incredibly hard on making sure they're clear that we took out jargon, we tried to make them very accessible um, so everyone can know what, what we're talking about. It's more just how would you layer them out over the course of the next few years um, because not everything's going to be done in year one. I, mean, I think that's the kind of work that we need I would, to do. I would just say give, give that some thought yeah. as you're preparing for the next meeting because yeah. I think when, when we as a committee get to doing the goals for next year, it'd be unsatisfied, to my, I'm speaking my personal opinion, right. but I'm, I, it might be shared by more than me, um, it'd be unsatisfying if all of our goals were process goals, right. like, I'm going to do a great job working on year one goals, you know, and I'll show you that by next year, right? right. Like, I'm making that stupidly yeah, yeah. up. My point right. is, like, that. that's like an unsatisfying <laughs> goal. I think it's probably some of that stuff around completing process-oriented outcomes and deliverables, yeah. but then presumably some other goals would be more substantive, like we've all agreed we want to go to the moon in five years. Yeah. What do we need to do? We need to build a Saturn rocket or design a Saturn rocket in year one, right? right. And so it would, I'd rather move in that direction yeah. in terms of it makes any sense, but I'm um, sorry, Mr. Evelyn, please. No, that's right. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to see the results of the, of the, the work. Um, I, I'm curious... You know, thinking about um, some of the issues that our, our chair was talking about earlier with the assessment method and some of the issues that we'll talk about soon with advocacy, if, ha, ha, to what degree do you, do you think the strategy sort of discussion and evolution of these, like, mm -hmm. long-term ideas has been affected by a potentially more resource-constrained environment than what we've operated in? Because what I'm thinking is, you know, mm -hmm. if in future years or decades there's an order of magnitude or more decrease in funding f to public education, that... It seriously alters what can be practically achieved as opposed to, you know, academically wished for. So just any general comments on that, how yeah. that's gone in, in the discussion? It's a real challenge. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's something that I've often had to be the um, unpopular person in the room to talk about that. I actually wrote, uh, and I think you'll see this in the final draft, a statement at the beginning that kind of speaks to, at a broad level, some of the fiscal challenges that we may anticipate moving forward. Um, and it was, a, I mean, to be very blunt, it was a frustration for members of the group who have really strong feelings and thoughts about how to improve our district. And even if some of them are relatively resource neutral, we may not be in a resource neutral environment. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, I would say, of great concern to the people who are involved in that group. And um, as much as I can try to explain bureaucratic processes around regional assessment methodologies, um, for our powerful 12 and 13 year olds and 16 year olds in the group, they're, they're thinking about their experience and how the good parts they want to keep and what they want to see different for the future for not just themselves, but the, their uh, younger um, literal and figurative siblings that are coming. So it is in the document. It is something that was uh, a topic of discussion very frequently. I think I should probably leave it there, but I could keep going. Right. Thank you. So this is obviously going to be on the agenda. Uh, and we'll be getting into it much more deeply. Um, so, if there's any, unless there are any other questions or comments, we'll move on. I think just one other thing to yeah. note, I'm sorry that I wish I'd said, is that uh, these processes are interesting because you start at this meta level where you have hundreds of feet, pieces of feedback and pages and pages of notes, and then you feel overwhelmed. Right? This is like every strategic planning process I've ever been in. And then, you know, the challenge is whittling it down to a finite number of things the district can actually take on. And I think what's worth noting is it, it's not going to be a 30-page document that, that we present. It's actually the work was taking all that feedback, all that work, and, and actually saying, no, we need to focus on a, a set, like, five or six outcomes that we need to, to work on. And so I just think what I'll have to do next time, but I want to preview with the community, is to share with the public that an incredible amount of work went into what will look from a text, like amount of text, 
not a tremendous amount of text. Um, now, the pages and pages which you'll see in the artifacts that I'll present of presentations and workflows and all, all that went into it, um, but I want to compliment the group because one of the most challenging things to do is to focus on a finite number of things in a comple as complex organization as we have. Um, but, you know, the group and I collectively were a little concerned about how that will be perceived, that people went spent so much time and what you end up with is um, a consensus from a very diverse group of individuals. By diverse, I'm talking in broad and specific terms. Um, that doesn't look like a 608-page facilities report that we got, you know, like to be, you know, so uh, I just promised them that I would preface, um, even preview that with the committee and the community that um, the challenge has been actually so many good ideas and then thinking what can an organization actually take on and be successful. And there was a strong commitment in the group of not just trying to do everything but actually doing a finite number of things really well to move the district forward. Was it us? Just a that final comment that you made about success, um, I just want to, I guess, make sure that the presentation that we're going to be hearing has a significant portion dedicated to evaluation, right, and how yeah. we know we're going to be successful <coughs> in the work that we're undertaking. Because I think that, you know, one of the, the most exciting things about this uh, undertaking to do a strategic planning process for the district is that we can get to a place where, as a community, we can agree on what it feels like to win and to, to, you know, to move our district forward, right? right? I'm calling that a win. Um, but, you know, I think that part of the challenge is knowing when we've actually gotten to a place where we've made the progress that we want to make, yeah. right? And so that we don't end up repeating a lot of the same mistakes, <coughs> and not, not just this district, but I think a lot of districts make, and a lot of communities make, in putting together a strategic plan uh, you know, are so focused on what's different from other work that's been done before um, and end up introducing something that's completely new, you know, that, that maybe doesn't necessarily meet the same kinds of goals that the, the community had set for itself previously. Uh, and it just becomes very challenging to try to, you know, move, like you said, a yeah. really complex organization forward in such a way. So I just want to make sure that we're paying attention to structure to balance to you know to uh, consistency across you know the, the work that's been done previously by the district and that there's evaluation measures being put into place to make sure that we can self-correct if not if necessary you know and that we're not just uh, putting something together for the sake of putting it together not that I would assume that about you no, know, no, but I think fine. you know what I mean I've, I do. I've mentioned this enough times before <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah great thank you so the next item uh, is going to be advocacy. Ms. Adonius, do you want to introduce the uh, document? Yeah. Mr. Demling? Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Demling. Um, you emailed this thing, so I figured. Yeah, well, it was uh, a joint effort. I think this is based on the last conversation that we had with <coughs> the regional school committee around uh, advocacy at the statewide level. Uh, work that Mr. Dumling has been doing and that I've been doing for the past couple of years in engaging legislators and engaging uh, statewide policymakers um, around you know a series of issues that are extremely important that end up affecting both our budgets but also uh, just you know kind of our vision for education in the future uh, moving forward and so we have undertaken already a lot of different meetings with with you know local elected uh, representatives as, as well as statewide representatives. Um, and have been participating in many different things, including, you know, asking the town council to sign on to the Promise Act to, to you know, pass a resolution not too long ago around uh, the Promise Act. But there's still a lot more that could be done. Um, I think the challenge for this committee is in, and I've talked with Mr. Dumling about this, is in coming up with a plan that feels doable, that doesn't feel like we're overreaching, um, and that still allows us to, you know, help have a say along yeah. with the other communities, you know, and, and we don't, well, I, I would speak for myself in this regard, I don't necessarily see our place as sort of leading, you know, a statewide campaign uh, to change the powers that be or change the way that things are. Um, I think there's a lot of other, you know, great organizations and individuals who are doing that kind of work. Um, but I do see us, you know, as, as being leaders, and I think we have, there's a lot of that we could be doing there. So hopefully this plan helps us get to that point. But I don't know if there's anything else, Mr. Dumling, that you want to add to that. No, I think that's perfectly well said. I think I think you articulated exactly what the sort of the challenge is when you engage mm -hmm. in advocacy is that it's this it's this bottomless <laughs> thing that the more you engage in it, the more there is to engage in. And you know, if you, if you let yourself go, you could be doing this 24/7 and leaving your job and family behind, which we are not in a position to do. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, not right now. Right. So, um, you know, and yet, you know, we don't want all of our action to be completely bubbleized into just, you know, just our own, you know, yeah. town. And so, how do you how do you do something local that's appropriate at our school committee level? And how do we collaborate with our colleagues potentially statewide? Right. Uh, picking our spots where we're leveraging right. opportunities. Yeah. Um, there was, so um, Ms. Kassinson, Ms. Ordonia, and I were, and, uh, were able to go to a, a legislative session that mm -hmm. um, our Senator, Joe Comerford, and our representative, Mindy Dome, uh, arranged uh, a couple weeks ago now. Um, and uh, Dr. Morris was there at the superintendent gathering pr prior to the, the school committee gathering. And it was, it was really interesting. I, I really wish that every person, uh, town member, a uh, select board member who advocates about assessment method could have been there. Because it was really interesting to to hear um, perspectives from different regional school districts and, and other smaller districts talking about the unfunded mandates, the the problems inherent with regional agreements, and and uh, uh, collaborating on budgets. And um, so Senator Lewis and Representative Peich, the uh, co-chair of the Joint Committee of Education, you know, got to hear that. Um, and uh, it, it, I thought it was interesting that it there was a, certainly a theme of urgency, but it was it was almost desperation on the point of, of some uh, some districts uh, you, you've uh, Mr. Nakajima, you've talked about you know in the, in the coming years you know this is can be difficult for our districts for our other districts that are already there you know I mean it's 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 really difficult and so it's on the one hand there's a lot of support for the like the promise act you know that we've we've endorsed yeah. and yet and yet acknowledging that you know with the, the, those unfunded mandates have to be taken care of as well so it's really it's a pretty powerful experience it's, it's interesting I mean I, I think so I was hinting earlier in the chair's report I think it may be difficult for our district, our collective district now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, what my real point was that if there's not if there's not more done about it, I think there's going to be a profound political backlash. That's going to be, it's going to be a beast that's hard for folks to handle in in Boston, because there there are. This is the weird thing about this conversation. I'm glad I like the plan, and I, I think, um, the only the only thing I'd like to figure out is what. When, you're, when we talk about item number four on the town council, is you know I'd love to understand better what like the Mass Municipal Association is doing, in particular, because I, I still think this is a a state and local fiscal issue that's masquerading as a school funding issue, and I, I know and I don't should be clever about that. There is a real problem with school funding, but the reality is since most towns and most cities will always try to fund their schools as best they can. They just don't have enough money. But the point is they're going to shift as much resources as they can into the schools that they possibly can, which means they're then always starving other accounts or raising the annual levy as much as they can. So the reason why I keep saying this is going to be a major political backlash at some point is actually not because of the schools. We already know our schools need more funding. It's going to be because all the... It's like my, my analysis of question two. It's because all the town meeting members and select board members and finance committee members and town councilors and city councilors and mayors mm -hmm. are going to lose their minds and start hitting this on, on a property tax, a state and local tax issue. But anyways, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, so that. to that point, um, so I can share this link with the committee. The Mass Municipal Association wrote an excellent letter that summarized exactly what you're talking about. They submitted to the, um, it was the Joint Ways and Means Committee. Uh, but it talked about you know their recommendations for the budget, and they really called out about um, you know about the hold harmless districts, about the charter school formula, about the charter funding, about the uh, unrestricted government aid, and and really put the context of of public education into municipal funding, and and exactly what you're talking about, how it shifts the burden to municipals, and it, it create it's it's a system that's designed to create income inequality because if municipals don't have the income, then your schools suffer as a result. So yes, that's um, I can send that link out. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be wonderful. So um, do you? So let's go through this item by item. Do you think that um, our committee or members of our committee should go to Boston or go to Springfield or split the difference and go to both? Do you have an opinion? Because there's more than one of us. The one is we could be in both places. Okay. I mean, I, I think that uh, the one in Springfield is designed specifically for community members and, you know, other folks who are interested in these issues that are here in Western Massachusetts mm -hmm. so that they don't have to go to Boston. Yep. I think that, you know, the, the choice is ultimately, of course, up to the individuals who want to go. Um, you know, Boston is far. <laughs> Boston at 5 o'clock uh, can be a little difficult, too. So. Okay. 
Marks? Just on that point, I know I spoke this morning actually with um, the president of the APA, Jean Fay, and I know she is. Uh, gonna, you all will receive an invitation for her because I think a I know a number of teachers uh, from our district will be attending the Springfield rally. Okay. If that makes a difference for any of you, I think that should actually. Yeah. I mean, if we if our community is in Springfield. I'm not trying to be facetious. I know we're closer to Springfield. Yeah. I'm just saying, if our neighbors are going and, and colleagues are going to be rallying in Springfield, then that gives a good reason to go to Springfield. Is it? Yes. I think it's. It, it, yeah, it's not. It's not a, a facetious point at all. I think it's. It's a strategic decision. You know, to uh, make sure that Western Rep from Massachusetts is represented for the reasons that Mr. Demley mentioned. You know, that meeting that we had with legislators, there were a lot of communities from Western Massachusetts who are are very you know passionate around the impact that these funding choices are having on their communities. And so, you know, going to Springfield is a perfect way to, to represent that. You yep. know? Great. Yes. Um, for my benefit and the benefit of anybody watching at home, is this the type of event that students or children would be welcome at? Yes. This is your answer. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay. So item number two, submit op-ed or letter to Boston Globe and Daily Hampshire Gazette. Uh, and it sounds to me like, which is great, this is particularly focusing on some of the areas that we have need that would get lost in the discussion, forgive me for saying this, but lost in the discussion of the Promise Act per se, right? I think to Mr. Dumling's many points earlier, this yeah, is, yeah. Uh, absolutely. No, 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 I, yeah, yeah. great. In I fact, I mean, however possibly we can capture the sentiment and the vibe in that, that room, into into words, I think is, is what we would we would try to do. Okay. I, I think we we have kind of an opportunity in that last year, um, some uh, regional school districts in Central Mass really got the grassroots effort out on transportation. So we've made a number of contacts mm -hmm. with um, school committees and other advocacy yeah. um, individuals across the state from regional schools, and uh, and we know a bunch locally who, and so this this is potentially something we could maybe get multiple sign-ons onto if um, if if we weren't too um, if we're too formal about it, maybe. I mean, it's kind of up to the committee, you know. Like, if, if we all sort of know the general position, right? That yeah. we need this commission in order to address this commission that's been recommended by the auditor uh, Suzanne Bump a year and a half ago. You know, she sort of, sort of laid out the Bible, the study of all the issues that yeah. need to be addressed with. And so, um, it, sh it wouldn't be too hard, I don't think, to get some individuals and to have a letter that's you know multi that would sort of represent here are all the districts across the state who feel left behind, who feel. Like you know, we're not part of this discussion, and have that kind of be the the mm -hmm. angle, the the hook. Yeah. Um, but that's just one one thought on tone. I think that sounds good. I mean, what are the any other thoughts? I mean, I think it sounds good. I think it. I think uh, to me, finding a way to do number two, and then to distill that in a way that connects the number four on this list makes enormous sense. Because logically, whatever's written in two could also be sent you know, as, a, as a bullet in four to the other groups, as well as um, just an encouragement to go. I mean, I think we could say Boston or Springfield, but I think we should just tell people, try to go to Springfield. You know, most of us are going to go to Springfield. So that, again, we can get some sort of en masse thing. Mm -hmm. Are you raising your hand? Oh, like. sorry. You're gesturing with your pen. Just okay. actively following along. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right, so do you, do you two want to work with me on a letter? Sure. Sure. Okay. That'd be great. Do you want to, we'll talk later? We'll talk later. <laughs> okay, it's we'll fine. We'll talk tomorrow. Okay, no, that's fine. Well, that's, just yeah. very quickly, I mean, you know, uh, we suggested a deadline of May 13th, which obviously doesn't give us too long. It's just a couple of weeks, right. but it's perfect timing for just how the budget process is going through. So, yeah. you know, hoping that that um, it just means we have to work quickly. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No, I mean, we can connect tomorrow. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Uh, all right. No, I don't think we need to vote this, by the way. I think it's a good thing, and we're agreeing to do some things, and that's going to be... Seems to be not accepted. It's a solid good thing. Cool. Yes. Uh, can we run by item three a little bit? Uh, sure. So uh, on the back of that page, it's kind of a summary of the, the charter mitigation. Right. Yeah. Thing. So, so just just to kind of couch what I've been trying to do with this. This is one of those problems. And uh, Mr. Daniels was talking about before about how how do you scope this so you don't become a statewide campaign chairman on <laughs> a particular issue, right? Um, 
So, so this is kind of a summary of the, the proposed charter mitigation change. When we talked about this before, this was just an idea in the governor's budget. It sits past the house budget, and yes. so it's become more of a reality. It's a so, living, breathing dragon. Yes, it might so, eat us all. Right. And so, at the at the legislative meeting with, um, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Senator Lewis. Uh, mm -hmm. He said he said he was surprised that it got into the the house budget. And so, budget process tactically where we are is that. Um, the Senate will, Ways and Means will now, is now in the process of crafting its budget. It will then propose its budget with the Senate, will then propose amendments and, and vote on. So we have this kind of brief window where these 40 senators or so have an opportunity to provide their input to the Senate Ways and Means Committee. And so um, I've had a, a, couple, a number of conversations uh, about this particular issue with Senator Comerford, who's mm -hmm. been extremely supportive about raising awareness. Um, not only did she, was she part of the team setting up that meeting, um, she forwarded uh, this general information on to Senator Lewis to make sure that they got that. So she's been great. Um, yeah. I think kind of a, the next sort of uh, action step would be twofold. Uh, one would be just sort of sharing this information with her. So this is specific. The top part is just sort of general description of what the change is. And then right. this is specific to, to our Senate district, to yeah. Senator Comerford's district, sort of show her what that, that impact is. And so, and to just kind of formally or informally ask her, you know, please express your opposition to the Senate Ways and Means Committee and help us, you know, um, work with your colleagues, you know, if it gets into the budget to support amendments and whatnot. Um, the second part that I thought would be manageable is that um, it, it, was, it was a bit of a spreadsheet lift to try and extract this list of, um, of districts, with, of school districts within the Senate district. Um, to make a very long story short, because there's multiple towns potentially within a school district and multiple senators within a, a town cross-referencing that all. But now that I sort of have that mechanism working, I can sort of generate this Senate district specific list for any of the 40 Senate districts. So short of quitting my job and just being a full-time chairman <laughs> for this idea, yeah. um, I thought one thing I could do is to just generate this for the cities and towns that are, uh, the school districts that are most affected and send it to them and mm -hmm. say, Here's what it looks like for Springfield and Springfield Senate District. Uh, the, we're asking our senators to oppose in ways and means. Uh, if if this is something that you know you want to advocate on, this is something you could do. So I could you know reach out informally to sure. school committees and let them sort of you know go at it as yeah, they, as we, they wish. Yeah, so but it, relative to what was being said here, do we know what MASC is doing on this? Yeah, so I've reached out to MASC. Um, I'll say this about MASC. I, I really like their current leadership. Some, some of their top-level leadership is very new, mm -hmm. um, and, so, and they obviously have a very full plate yeah. <laughs> uh, with the Promise and Cherish Act and all that. Um, they don't yet have a really effective infrastructure for uh, allowing school committees to communicate with each other in an effective way okay. for advocacy. Um, and um, you know, and so I've, I've reached out to their sort of advocacy coordinators, and they've suggested a, a listserv, which is not really that active. I mean, we'll try it, um, but they they basically aren't offering you know really effective coordinating tools. And so um, I thought sort of a, a sort of middle ground effort that you know I could engage in is to sort of just you know reach out to school committees individually and say. Hey, here's the information for your Senate district. You know, if you want to do something on this. That's a question. What's what, what's I forget, which senator put forward the the bill that Mayor Narkowitz <coughs> went to the Beacon Hill and lobbied on behalf and would change charter funding. That was H four eighteen. That was a Mass Municipal Association backed. This is to change the charter school formula, yeah. right? Yeah. Was yeah. there a senator? Well, there must have been a. A senator who was a lead senator. Or, yeah. I, don't, I don't remember who the senator was. You should find out and give this to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm serious because to me, the best way to kill this is to say, because in a weird way, the more I've been thinking about this, in a really weird way, the argument that the governor and Pizer have is, is in, in a really weird way, almost not illogical. Because basically what they're saying by changing the formula is, you know we're never really going to fully fund this, right? <laughs> so why don't we just effectively eliminate, for all intents and purposes, eliminate it, except for the hardest cases in, in, you know, for one year, basically. And they're like, in the weirdest way, like that actually almost makes sense. Stop, I mean, we're going to stop promising to do something we're never going to do, right? But so to me, the best argument against it is to say, if we think, at least on the Senate side, that you're gonna have this big debate around um, rethinking charter funding generally, 
then why would you miss with a single component of it in advance of that broader discussion? I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, it, it does. Um, so I, I think maybe this is just the cynical person in me, but I really don't think there's much attention if at all on changing the charter school formula right now. I mean, kudos to Mayor Nockwitz for going out there yeah. and testifying and MMA for, for pushing the issue. That's great. I, I, just, I, I don't think it's really anybody. It's such a hot button political football. There'd really have to be like a push to urgency for it. Well, that'd it. be sort of the question for the for the senator. Is this right. getting any traction? Or not? Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, it's it's sort of the best argument for doing it because otherwise, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. One way of looking at it is this is a lot of money. Another way of looking at it is it's fifty thousand bucks, eighty thousand bucks. There, it's not that much money. I think uh, what you're suggesting is a very easy thing to do, and I think we can do it, and you know, and should do it, yeah. and just to reach out. Um, and then, I, you know, I think just to the earlier question about what what is the MASC is doing around this. Mm -hmm. So they have their annual MASC day on the hill next Tuesday, I believe it is. That's tomorrow. Uh, is it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. So it's May first, not May. That's right. It is tomorrow. Yeah. I'm thinking about the conversation that we had last week. Um, anyway, obviously we're not going. So. <laughs> Or at least I'm not going. I don't know if Mr. Dumling decided to, to go. Uh, it's it's a, a big ask to take a day and go to Boston yeah. for you know for this for limited gain. I think quite honestly, uh, but I think that you know sharing this kind of information with uh, a lot of the senators the way that Mr. Dumling uh, you know articulated before makes a, a lot of sense and it's a you know low hanging fruit that we've talked about yeah. before. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons for this advocacy plan. We said sort of supporting the work of you know, MASC and others uh, in, in raising awareness. Uh, if we can do things like that you know, and just send along information or send along you know, emails, it seems like a pretty easy ask you know, to do. Yeah. So. Now your hand's definitely up. It is definitely up. So it's just to answer your question about the MMA's charter school finance bill, it was Representatives Cabral and Brodeur, who okay. are the... Ones, people who put that. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. We'll move on. Thank you. Uh, math update. So again, we'll stay with keeping it brief. Um, so we'll start with the uh, larger six through twelve, or seven in this case seven through twelve work, uh, which is. Um, it's actually K to 12 work, frankly, uh, which is to we've been revising the team has been revising the mathematics vision and core values statement that went out to the community last week in the Friday update to gather feedback from other community members on that. Um, so I know they're receiving some feedback on that, but we hope to finalize that document that will be no pun intended, but truly core in terms of decision making tree to come to mm -hmm. make sure any kind of um, process you know fits within that vision we've still been using the kind of early the not early draft i think you know moderate to late draft of that document uh as the high school has been working with parent guardian reps um there's been meetings after school which was the 22nd and 23rd of last week to develop criteria for the textbook review um and the same group met last friday and then half a day yesterday which i actually said it on part of to work on the process for textbook review selection and hear presentations for different vendors came in and um, did their spiels um so there's a ranking mechanism right now for that group Meetings are planned for coming days to engage other stakeholders. So um, next Monday, May 6th at 5 o'clock, there's a lot going on next Monday, um, at the high school library right here. And then Tuesday, May 7th at 8.30 in the morning in the high school cafeteria or open sessions for anyone in the community who would like to come in, uh, offer feedback. Be, those will be facilitated by Susan Looney, who you met, who did the mm -hmm. report, and her organization is continuing to work with us. Um, but there are lots of opportunities for feedback along the way as well as our typical ways where we'll share out and make publicly available. One of the challenges we're finding this time is there's, um, as even uh, traditional looking textbooks are moving to electronic resources, like the sharing out is, we're, we're finding we're actually having to adjust that. I mean, uh, many of the ones we're looking at uh, are not traditional textbooks, and that's uh, forecasting that will go in that direction. So sort of the public review process is looking a little different than it has mm -hmm. in the past, but we're working on that. But those will be two sessions for people in the community interested to participate. Um, and we hope to come back. Uh, the reason this one's brief is we hope to come back, particularly on the 28th, although it looks like uh, I've got that wrong in setting up meeting agendas with um, kind of more specifics of, of where we feel like we're landing uh, as it relates to high school math curricula. We've been using as a... Uh, 
primary sorting mechanism, um, the Ed Reports website, which is run by third party third party vendors. It's not a they don't receive money from any of the textbook publishers. You heard about it at a previous meeting. Uh, that any program that we review has to have high rating on that. Uh, if it doesn't have high rating, which just means it's not aligned to standards, um, we're not looking at it. And the other piece is one that uh, incorporates balance between the practice standards, which are some of the critical thinking, problem solving skills, and, and also the computational fluency that students need to be successful. So. All of those things are in the mix, and uh, we have uh, great representation from the department, obviously, but also parents. And I want to thank um, parents, and particularly Nancy Stewart, who's the outgoing CPAC president, for one last hurrah of spending days upon days looking at math curricula, which is which is great to have her lens within there. There are special educators in the room as well, but I really appreciate Nancy's point of view uh, and want to thank her. At the middle school level, um, we've had multiple meetings now looking at, uh, I think Mr. Sheehan talked about this last time, Open Up Resources, which is a uh, online um, textbook. It's not an online, uh, it's not like Khan Academy or something that is like, it's, it's a traditional textbook that's delivered online for schools that have one-to-one -one computers. Um, so we've had two sessions. We have another one actually tomorrow um, that I'll be attending part of as much as I can. We were also joined by the curriculum coordinator from Union 28, and the math coach from Northampton, because they are also looking at this product. Uh, Mr. Sheehan's contacted uh, and had a long conversation yesterday with Brookline Public Schools, who have been implementing for two years this curriculum, which not the same demographics, but at least similar demographics. Um, and so that process is, is also pushing ahead uh, in a slightly different way than the high school. And I think our goal, you know, we could do a quick update on the 14th. The more I think about it, that more maybe in superintendent update than a full agenda item. But on the 28th, we'll certainly want to spend some time um, with where we are and where we're landing and how we're thinking about not just the curriculum, but the professional development, the training, and the plan for implementation, which is at least as, if not more, important than the specific choice, in my opinion. Okay. Are there questions to the superintendent? Yes. Question that's somewhat tangential, so I'm going to try to keep it brief. But um, I guess I've been I've been thinking a lot about the fact that we might be moving towards this online textbook, and what that means in terms of screen time for our kids right. and things like that. So I'm just curious if any other curriculums are currently delivered in this way, or would math be the only one where where it would be? So there's no other <laughs> curriculums that are delivered in this way. Would I think it is the case for a lot of when students are writing that while well, they're given options, most students will use Chromebooks complete their writing, that's a little different than what we're talking about. Yeah. I think the one caveat I want to say for the, if we go in this direction, is they do sell student workbooks, you know, they're relatively inexpensive to go along with it, so you're not as beholden to looking at a screen, and that's an active conversation that I know some of the teachers have raised as well. Um, so I think more to come. I'll find out more about that tomorrow, because we're having, it's not someone from the company, it's actually uh, a different Someone from Looney and Associates who's done training on this particular text is coming, uh, who's done it in, in lots of communities, and frankly, in communities where not only did families not always have high-speed internet, the school didn't always have reliable high-speed internet. Um, so it would be really interesting to hear her experience working with multiple schools on that particular lens. But it's not that that's a, something that is actively coming up. I think the other piece that I think is highly relevant is uh, it's a textbook that, again, is a balanced textbook, so it's um, not a... If students are looking too much at their screen, that means they're not actually doing the math, right? So that the activities that come from that are not, well, I do, I look at the screen and I do numbers one through 10 on the, in the workbook. It's actually much more uh, a, a program consistent with what we heard earlier that is, is actively focused on problem solving where students are working collaboratively to solve problems. So it's uh, not the case that even if we did just use the online curriculum that students would be staring at a screen for 45 minutes at a time, that, that would mean that we're not implementing the curriculum as it's written. Okay. Are there further questions for today? Yes. Just a, a comment about something that I read recently, and you know, and I think it, it's related to your question about if other communities have been contacted. It sounds like you guys have been doing your due diligence, um, but you know, there's been research that's come out not too long ago about uh, the, the different ways that people learn and how learning from textbooks is actually very different from learning from you know computers or, or screens. Uh, so I, I just would hope that the district is looking into that a little more seriously mm -hmm. because I think that in recent years, uh, you know, communities around the country have been literally sold right. these uh, you know software programs and these tools for e-learning that 
are proving to not be as effective as they were sold, right? So, yeah. you know, it, it is, I think, a, a, just a big question mark there for knowing what we know now versus what we knew a few, even like three years ago about, you know, the brain and how it's, how we learn, especially for young students, um, it's worth pursuing and, and understanding properly. Yeah, can I try to clarify? Sure. Um, not to belabor the point. So I think at the high school, some of the tools that the, that the committee is looking at are have more e-learning features or functions. The um, six through eight curriculum that we're looking at is truly a textbook that's delivered a, um, electronically instead of where like the e-learning suite where there's applets and you know that that's actually not the focus. And and I guess the the slight or the comment I'd like to make is whether it's in paper form or textbook or um, electronic form, if you're thinking about a textbook, we wouldn't want our students looking at that resource for the majority or the bulk of their math class anyway, right? Um, so I think there are like some of the, there was a big New York Times article, I want to say it was last week, um, that talked about truly like e-learning tools and mm -hmm. what's being considered at the, for the middle school is intentionally not that. At the high school, there are some curriculums that are, have more elements of that and that actually has been an active discussion of that committee. It's interesting, I think that would be a, there's sort of two, this conversation is splitting in two different directions that are complementary, but are, I think are distinct. I mean, one is looking at, um, ha like in other words, you've been having professionally right. with your colleagues a conversation about the use of online tools and the benefits and, and uh, more negative aspects of that, how to integrate it appropriately. Um, it'd be great to surface that conversation at the school committee at some point. Mm -hmm. So I think people are reading, I saw the same article. Yeah. Yeah. The people are seeing articles like that, but they're also just, they're, they're concerned about, you know, the bright, shiny electronic ob object being seen as delivering educational value. And I think a lot of people are skeptical of it, but it's also just interesting to think, well, how are you guys thinking? How are you, you and your team thinking about it as professionals in the subject? The second, which distinct but complementary topic, is literally thinking about, and actually I remember Mr. Demling brought this up I think a year ago, of thinking about, or maybe last fall, thinking about the topic of the health and wellness of students and the impact of screen time of various forms on them. And what are we doing? How are we thinking about it? How are we assessing it? How are we bringing that thinking into our work? And, and I, it, so this is a topic kind of for another day because I'm not, you, you've already been saying what you're saying, right. that you're not, you're not really trying to do that here, but I think there would be good reason for the committee to not really be satisfied with that as the mm -hmm. end of the discussion. Right, absolutely. Um, particularly because it's, I mean, not to belabor it, but I'm just saying there's, 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 got, there's got to be a development of a good amount of research trying to figure out what happens when you take a toddler or even a near infant and you introduce them into the world in which they're bombarded and engaged with electronic and other devices and then you push that through for 17 or 18 years what how does it affect them developmentally what's you know what are the you know all that kind of stuff and hopefully there's a better body of like you know peer review scholarly clinical yeah. information on that but thinking of knowing how that's being affecting what we're doing and how we're able to engage with it in, and then more importantly, tailor what we do in a way that's very humanistic right. and child-centered in terms of their development is like massively important. So I threw all that out. I know the next person is Mr. Demling because he had his hand up earlier. And then I'm going to sweep around the room and then Mr. Minino. Uh So I won't go down the road of the theme that Mr. Nakajima just talked about. <laughs> so I've gone down that road before. Um, but that is a very important topic when it comes onto our agenda. Um, I, guess the, I guess the thing I would just um, recommend is, is Regardless of whether it's online or, or papyrus or whatever, um, there seemed to be a lot of excitement um, expressed from the people who will be making this decision about that online curriculum. And so just in terms of doing your due diligence, the, uh, the immediate flag that should go up there is, then, oh, okay, that, that means you need strong devil's advocate scrutiny of that particular option <coughs> precisely because it's the one you're most excited about at the beginning. Right? So therefore, the, the one that you have the highest risk of missing right. potential issues with is the one that everybody is like, yeah, 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 right? And so you always kind of want one sort of pessimistic, snarky, critical, you know, downer in the room who's saying, well, this is why this, this is, has a problem. And, you know, just to 
just to give it a more robust, you know, discussion. But that's it. That's my one. Is Gaston here? I just want to sweep it with no, no, no. That's fine. The, uh, I just want to thank you and echo everything that you said, Chair Nakajima. I would love to see the school committee um, looking at screen time as part of a wider uh, inquiry about health and wellness and kids. Um, and just a particular note about this this online textbook or whatever. Um, in terms of diverse learners, it would seem to me that some kids would just not interface well with screens and computers. So I would hope that um, there would be yeah, other options, paper options or whatever, to support people with different learning needs around that. Thank you. Is it honest? Is your hand up? Yeah, I think it was just a, a response back. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I wasn't referring to younger students, meaning elementary school students or even middle school students. I think it's just, you know, brains uh, being what they are uh, and us understanding now that brains don't stop developing until the age of 25, that, you know, um, the, the less uh, exposure you have to, uh, you know, screens, even just throughout that entire developmental period, right. probably the better. They're still unclear about it. You know, you, I think I've seen the research the same way I have. Um, but I think that, you know, yes, uh, also to what Ms. Kastensen just said about uh, understanding, you know, the, the impact uh, along health and wellness and being able to track that would be really just important so that we, you know, are making room for students who may learn differently. Sabrina? Yep. Still have a comment? Question? Just to come in, I reference, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. <laughs> the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, in the last two weeks had a big article about, I think, Summit Academy, where the entire curriculum was offered on screens, and teachers just walked around the room guiding students. It was devastating. I mean, especially the idea that certain kids got headaches, uh, they couldn't follow, uh, special ed students had a difficult time with, with using screens. Uh, it was a devastating article. Yeah. And, and some Kansas or Nebraska That's towns uh, uh, adopted wholesale because it was cheaper. Right. Was it well, sort of building on that, this discussion, is there's, there's two very different topics here that, and I think, I mean, you touched on it, um, that one is a, a textbook that's replaced, you know, that happens to be digitized, that is replacing, re so it's reading activity that is being done on a screen versus a book, and, um, and then what are the accommodations that we might need to consider versus that article, which is very different is my understanding, which is Actually, it's it's an e-learning and a digital learning environment that is very different than an online curriculum. And I think choosing the language when we when we get to that to help not just ourselves here, but people that are not as close to it to understand the differences between what you're what we're looking at this online curriculum, which is not the same thing as that um, summit academy summit learning. Um, and I so. And, and also then when we're t thinking about screen time too, screen time that is devoted to reading and, and it, it's different from, you know, replacing activity that would have been, so, you know, sitting still and reading something in a book versus sitting still and reading something on your Chromebook is very different than sitting for hours on end and doing all of your learning and not having the interpersonal connection with your teachers and, and paras. So I, I think language is important, and mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but I think when, when we come to that um, to that presentation and, and the future discussion, that that will be very important. You know one thing that makes sense to me? I think that's a great way of summing up and adding to the conversation we're having, that it'd be interesting not just to talk about what the curriculum is you're going to pick, but talk about what the student experience is going to look like both in the classroom and right. yeah. working in team mm -hmm. settings as well as working with static material. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, when you're presenting next time, right. talking about literally, yes, talk about the curriculum you're choosing, right. obviously, yeah. but, but then talk about literally. Because also a lot of, this reminds me of the comments we're getting from the public and through all the emails and other conversations we had. They, they, yes, they were about the curriculum, but kind of no, they weren't. Right. They were really about here's what my child has experienced or what I'm hearing right. they're experiencing when they're at home alone in the room, when they're in the classroom, when they're out working with their fellow students. It's all of those things. And so hearing from you right. uh, and Mr. Sheehan 
So what's the update in terms of how are those experiences changing mm -hmm. and what is it going to be mm -hmm. would be really interesting and valuable, I think, for the, for the public as much as anything, because I agree with that comment that, you know, ultimately we need to help expand people's awareness of, use this as a forum to expand the public's awareness of what change they're going to expect. Yeah. yeah. So uh, probably shouldn't respond, but I'll, I'll do it for a quick second, which is uh, I'm not going to do a defense of screens because um, I, I empathize with many things people are saying, but from an accessibility point of view, based on language, based on special needs, there is there are huge advantages to thinking about curriculums that can be delivered uh, in ways where there can be quick translation immediately, no matter what student's home language is, where there may be tactile functions that work well for specific students, where um, spelling may be an issue for some students and, and has having some augmentative strategy. So I just want to balance the equation. I don't disagree with what I heard tonight, mm -hmm. but I do think we have students that are accessing the curriculum that frankly couldn't if some s technology that comes with screens wasn't available, that 20 years ago didn't access the curriculum. So <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm very empathetic to the point of view, but based on what I see on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm in schools, I also just want to balance that there are technologies that are making learning accessible for students that weren't before. And so we have to figure out that balance. But I imagine, I, I, I felt urgency to at least suggest that there are opportunities that um, digital technology offers that opens up learning that wasn't previously available that I see like literally on a daily basis. And then so. if the committee disagrees, then what they should do is we should all throw away our smartphones <laughs> and our tablets as we're walking out the door here because None of us think that there's any great value that we've received from enabling, I mean, everyone yeah. here. I have a is, set of encyclopedias on my bookshelf. I'm just, I'm not, I'm just saying I yeah. think it's a, good, it's a good rejoinder that obviously the Internet age, the development of apps and portable devices and tablets have been extraordinarily beneficial on multiple dimensions. Right. But let's move on. Yeah. Well, could I just finish my statement because I wasn't quite... Oh, I thought you were done. No, no. So I think the challenge that it we like face... Seems like you're summing up. No, I just the challenge we yeah. face collectively is how do we harness those technologies to use them effectively to benefit students and not use them because it's convenient or easy or inexpensive uh, to replace things that we actually don't need replacing. And I think that in, therein lies a challenge of how to harness technology for its use, and it may look... You know, ability to differentiate sometimes gets lost. It's like, well, we're in a one-to-one -one district. Everyone has a Chromebook. That doesn't mean everyone has to use the Chromebook the same way. Um, so that's the conversation I'd like to have is what's the appropriate way that technology enhances the learning experience of students. And that's not to replace everything we're doing with technology. Um, but I think that's, in my head, how I frame when I see technology being used well and where I see technology being used in a way where students are just looking at screens too often, not actually for a learning there's no learning benefit to it. And, and so for me, that's, I guess, where I'd like to frame out a future conversation. I'm done. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Good. yeah. Let's move on. I mean, also part of the reason is because, as I think I was reminded earlier, we ble we're bleeding on the school committee planning pretty badly in that topic. So I'm <laughs> wanting to move on for that reason alone. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone wants to bring up another comment, bring it up under that item. <laughs> uh, so, accept gifts. Uh, Ms. Kastensen, do you have a motion? Sure. There's a handout that I'm late. Oh, thanks. Here we go. Late. Got it? Sorry. All right. Yeah. Um, I would like to move to accept the following um, gifts. We have Donor Project Bread, um, number 68596, to support Teacher Champion and Ward, Patricia, Tra Patricia Taylor's school-based nutrition program of Patricia's choosing in the amount of $1,000. From Amherst Academy, number 1590, to support Amherst Regional High School 2019 Amherst Academy, Academy Excellence in Latin Scholarship in the amount of $1,000. From Anonymous, number 61371510, to support Amherst Regional High School at the principal's discretion in the amount of $22.76. And from various donors to support the high school softball program in memory of Donald Jabavik. That name? I hope I'm not mispronouncing it. I'm sorry. In the amount of $255 to total $2,277.76. And then oh, that's all we're doing no. for this meeting. This is for the next meeting? We, no, we would. 
Oh, we're going to do this one too. I get it. Okay. And then finally, from Project Bread, number 68625, to support 2019 Healthy School Breakfast Grant in the amount of $8,000. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Ms. Kassenson, seconded by Ms. McDonald. Yes. Just one note that Patricia Taylor is a special educator at the high school, and this award was um, came from Project Bread, was in honor of her work, uh, making sure that our students are eating well and the nutrition is a key part of learning. So I just want to acknowledge Ms. Taylor's work at our high school. Right. Uh, any further discussion? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is read. Speaker Bob, we're moving in. Carries unanimously, eight to nothing. Uh, on to school committee planning. We have another handout that has the first August of May 2019. Uh, let's run around through them. Sure. So, superintendent evaluation artifacts, um, <coughs> later time, start time discussion that has been on the docket for a while. We'll, I'll present my thoughts on that. School policy on food service collections. Uh, we'd like to update how that policy is going. So you know, that was a policy that was passed previously, and we want to update with some data and perhaps some discussion. And even though it's a policy, it's not. We're not suggesting a change in the policy. We think it'd be better to bring to the full committee yeah. if that's agreeable. Um, strategic planning presentation and discussion. Uh, we have approved clerical and media award recipients. Math update. I think actually, as I mentioned orally, I'd like to move it back to the 28th. 28th, we'll have the seal of biliteracy. So that with the Look Act, there is a formal process that we're undertaking to identify a seal of biliteracy, which would be something that would be part of um, included in graduation, um, not for this year, but we need to actually eventually have it approved at school committee to implement for next year. So this would not be asking for a vote, but just giving update of where we are. Vaping prevention, substance abuse, another one that's been on the dock for a while, homelessness and, and foster care, and not just the transportation, but more generally, mm -hmm. as well as the finances. Discipline data, so Ms. Cunningham will go back, uh, will come back and offer uh, an update on our, her previous discussion with, she's, as she said she would, with just more data in it because we're further along in the school year. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can think about whether this is a separate agenda item, it may just be a superintendent update item, but just at that point, the first meeting for the grade six to eight study will have occurred, so mm -hmm. just update on the progress, and thanks for Ms. McDonald for volunteering to be part of that. Strategic planning, you know, we'll gather feedback in the 14th possible vote on um, what, what's being presented, and um, and then we'll have the math update uh, moved to the 28th. Great. So are there other, um, I mean, these meetings are obviously kind of full as they look. Um, if there are other items that we've talked about that we haven't put on, I mean, at this point, part of what we're going to have to do, too, is look at what we do the remainder of this year. And then also what we, that doesn't fit, that we might say, maybe we should, we have to put it in the hopper and say, is this something we want to address at some point in the next year? And I think, you know, honestly, uh, Dr. Morris, at some point later this spring, I think and it could be in alignment with talking about superintendent goals for next year, like even an initial conversation about that thought. I think it'd be worth thinking about what topics and how we would talk about topics of the coming year, because there might even be planning or work that you'd, you and your team would be doing over the summer that might inform discussion next year, but also it has to align with strategic planning, so that coming up, and trying to get those things lined uh, in alignment would be a good thing to talk about. Anyways, is there anything further for this item? Anyone? So the only other thing I was going to, um, if middle school roof, I don't think there's any rush from that, and Sean, Mr. Mangano, I think, in bringing them back in June okay. to talk through because it's it'd be bonded anyway, so it's not like it's urgent from our perspective or from financial perspective to, to rush that conversation. Uh, we also don't have official word from MSBA, so we'd okay. like to come back to that before the summer, but we, unless the committee feels urgency, we'd like to hold that for a June meeting. Okay, well, seeing nothing else, Ms. Kassinson, do you have a motion? Your last motion? <laughs> <laughs> I'll move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. I moved and seconded. All those in favor? It carries unanimously. Eight to Ms. Kassinson's motion carries eight to nothing. Congratulations, <laughs> Ms. Kassinson. <laughs> Did we thank Ms. Kassinson?